hearing to order. I'd like to thank our witnesses today, Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates. Dan, welcome back to uh, your family here in the United States Senate. Department of Justice Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, Director of National Security Agency Admiral Mike Rogers, and Acting Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Andrew McCabe. Welcome to all four of you. I appreciate you coming today to discuss one of our most critical and publicly debated foreign intelligence tools. Title VII of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, commonly known as FISA, is set to expire on December 31, 2017. Title VII includes several crucial foreign intelligence collection tools including one known primarily as Section 702. Section 702 provides the capability to target foreigners who are located outside the United States, but whose foreign communications happen to be routed to and acquired inside the United States. Section 702 collection is exceptionally critical to protecting Americans both at home and abroad. It is integral to our foreign intelligence reporting on terrorist threats, leadership plans, intentions, counterproliferation, counterintelligence, and many other issues that affect us. It is subject to multiple layers of oversight and reporting requirements from the executive, the judicial, and the legislative branches. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court must, all, uh, must approve minimization procedures for each relevant IC agency before the agency can review collected information. At the end of the day, FISA collection provides our government with the foreign intelligence that our nation needs to protect Americans at home and abroad and in many cases our allies. I understand there is an ongoing debate pitting privacy against national security. And there are arguments within the debate that have merit. As we all too painfully know, the intelligence community's valuable FISA collection was thrust into the public spotlight following the illegal and unauthorized disclosures by former NSA analyst Edward Snowden. As a result, the United States government and this committee redoubled its efforts to oversee FISA collection authorities, which already were subject to historical robust oversight. But I also think it's fair to say that some entities overreacted following Snowden's disclosures, and now Congress must justify what courts repeatedly have upheld as a constitutional and lawful authorities. And I also think that it's fair to say that nothing regarding this lawful status has changed since Director Clapper and Attorney General Holder wrote to Congress in February 2012 to urge us to pass a straight reauthorization of FISA, and since the Obama administration followed suit in September 2012. What has changed, however, is the intensity, scale, and scope of the threats that face our nation. This is not the time to needlessly roll back and handicap our capabilities. I know a lot of people will use this hearing as an opportunity to talk about the committee's Russian investigation. I'd like to remind everyone that 702 is one of our most effective tools against terrorism and foreign intelligence targets. I hope my colleagues and those closely watching this hearing realize that at the end of the day, 
Our constitutional obligation is to keep America and our citizens safe. The intelligence community needs Section 702 collection to successfully carry out its mission. And it is this committee's obligation to ensure that the IC has the authorities and the tools it needs to keep us safe at home and abroad. Gentlemen, I look forward to your testimony and continued efforts to maintain the integrity of this vital collection tool. I now turn to the Vice Chairman for any comments he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for hosting this hearing on the very important 702 program in ways that we might ensure its effectiveness, and I will get to that in a moment. However, given the panel of witnesses here, and given the recent news about ongoing investigations into Russian interference in our 2016 elections, I'm going to have to take at least part of my time to pose some questions during my question time. Each of you here today, we all know, have taken an oath to defend the Constitution. As leaders of the intelligence community, you've also committed to act and to provide advice and counsel in a way that is unbiased, impartial, and devoid of any political considerations. This is the essence, quite honestly, of what makes our intelligence community and all the men and women who work for you so impressive. You tell it straight, no matter which political party is in charge. And that's why it's so jarring to hear recent reports of White House officials, perhaps even the President himself, attempting to interfere and enlist our intelligence community leaders in any attempt to undermine the ongoing FBI investigation. Obviously, tomorrow, there's another big hearing. We'll be hearing from former FBI Director Comey. I imagine he'll have something to say about the circumstances surrounding his dismissal. We have now heard the President himself say that he was thinking about the Russia investigation when he fired Director Comey, the very individual who was overseeing that same investigation. Today, we'll have an opportunity to ask Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein about his role in the Comey firings as well. Additionally, we've seen reports, some as recently as yesterday, that the President asked at least two of the leaders of our nation's intelligence agencies to publicly downplay the Russia investigation. The President is alleged to have also personally asked Director Coates and CIA Director Pompeo to intervene directly with then-Director Comey to pull back on his investigation. I'll be asking, as I've told him, DNI Director Coates and NSA Director Admiral Rogers about those reports today. Because if any of this is true, it would be an appalling and improper use of our intelligence professionals. An act, if true, that could erode the public's trust in our intelligence institutions. The IC, as I've grown to know over the last seven and a half years I've been on this committee, prides itself appropriately on its fierce independence. Any attempt by the White House or even the President himself to exploit this community as a tool for political purposes is deeply, deeply troubling. I respect all of your service to the nation. I understand that answering some of the questions that the panel will pose today may be difficult or uncomfortable, given your positions in the administration. But this issue is of such great importance. The stakes are so high. I hope you will also consider all of our obligation to the American people to make sure that they get the answers they deserve to so many questions that are being asked. Now let me return to the subject of our hearing. Mr. Chairman, I agree that the reauthorization of Section 702 is terribly important. As the attacks in London, Paris, Manchester, Melbourne, and the list unfortunately goes on and on, all those attacks have demonstrated terrorists continue to plot attacks that target innocent civilians. Section 702, under court order, 
collects intelligence about these potential terrorist plots. It authorizes law enforcement and the intelligence community to collect intelligence on non-U.S. persons outside the United States, where there is reasonable suspicion that they seek to do us harm. I've been a supporter of reauthorizing Section 702 to protect Americans from terrorist attacks. And I'm eager to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to make sure that we reauthorize it before the end of this year. A reauthorization of Section 702 should ensure also that there is robust oversight and restrictions to protect the privacy and civil liberties of Americans. Those protections remain in place, and if there are areas where those protections can be strengthened, we ought to look at those as well. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to our hearing. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Uh, let me say for all members, votes uh, are no longer scheduled for 1030. If you've not gotten that word, votes have been moved to 145. <clears throat> when this hearing adjourns, uh, we will reconvene at 2 p.m. for a closed-door session on Section 702. I intend to start that hearing promptly at 2. Uh, today, members will be recognized by seniority for questions up to five minutes. With that, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Director Coach, you are recognized to give testimony on behalf of all four of you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Burr, <coughs> Chairman Warner, members of the committee. Um, we are pleased to be here today at your request to talk about an important and perhaps the most important piece of legislation that affects uh, the intelligence uh, community. I'm here with my colleagues. <clears throat> I would like to take uh, <clears throat> the opportunity to explain in some detail uh, Section 702, given this uh, as a public hearing, uh, and hopefully the public uh, will be watching, uh, our efforts to provide transparency in terms of how we protect the privacy and civil liberties of our American citizens uh, needs to be explained. Uh, the program needs to be understood, and so I appreciate your patience as I <clears throat> talk through in my opening statement uh, the value of 702 to our intelligence community and to keeping Americans safe. Intelligence collection under Section 702 of FISA amendments has produced and continues to produce significant intelligence that is vital to protect the nation against international terrorism, against cyber threats, weapons proliferators, and other threats. At the same time, Section 702 provides strong protections for the privacy and civil liberties of our citizens. Today, the horrific attacks that recently have occurred in Europe are still at the top of my mind. Um, I was just in Europe days before the first uh, attack in Manchester, uh, followed by other attacks that have subsequently taken place. I was in discussion with my British colleagues uh, through, uh, through this, as well as colleagues in other European nations. And my sympathies go out to the victims and families of those uh, that have received these heinous attacks and to the incredible resilience that these communities affected by this violence have shown. Having just returned from Europe less than three weeks ago, I'm reminded of why Section 702 is so important to our mission, of not only protecting American lives, but the lives of our friends and allies around the world. And although the many successes enabled by 702 are highly classified, the purpose of the authority is to give the United States intelligence community the upper hand in trying to avert these types of attacks before they transpire which is why permanent reauthorization of the FISA Amendments Act without further amendment is the intelligence community's top legislative priority. And based on the long history of oversight and transparency of this authority, I would urge the Congress to enact this legislation at the earliest possible date to give our intelligence professionals the consistency they need to maintain our capability. Let me begin today by giving an example of the impact of Section 702 of FISA. It's been cited before, but I think it is worth mentioning again. 
an NSA FISA Section 02 collection against an email address used by an al-Qaeda courier in Pakistan revealed communications with an unknown individual located within the United States. The U.S.-based person was urgently seeking advice on how to make explosives. NSA passed this information on to the FBI, which in turn was able to quickly identify the individual as Nazbullah Zazi. And as you know, Zazi and his associates, in fact, had imminent plans to detonate explosives on Manhattan's subway lines. After Zazi and his co-conspirators were arrested, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board stated in its report, and I quote, without the initial tip-off about Zazi and his plans, which came about by monitoring an overseas foreigner under Section, section 702, the subway bombing plot might have, ex have succeeded. This is just one example out of many of the impacts this authority has had on the IC's ability to thwart imminent threats and plots against the United States citizens and our friends and allies overseas. Since it was enacted nearly 10 years ago, FISA has, the FISA Act has been subject to rigorous and constant oversight by all three branches of government. Indeed, we regularly report to the Intelligence and Judiciary Committees of both the House and the Senate how we have implemented the statute, the operational value it has afforded, and the extensive measures we take to ensure that the government's use of these authorities complies with the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Further, over the past few years, we have engaged in an unprecedented amount of public transparency on the, on the use of these authorities. <clears throat> in the interest of transparency, and because this is a public hearing, allow me to provide an overview of the framework for Section 702 and the reasons why the Congress amended FISA in 2008. I will then briefly address why 702 needs to be reauthorized, and finally, I will discuss oversight and compliance and how we are, are ensuring and continue to ensure the rights of U.S. citizens, rights that need to be protected. <clears throat> At the outset, I want to stress three things as a backdrop to everything else that my colleagues and I are presenting today. First, as I mentioned at the outset, Collection Under 702 has produced and continues to produce intelligence that is vital to protect the nation against international terrorism and other threats. Secondly, there are important legal um, limitations found within Section 702 of FISA, and let me no uh, note four of these legal limitations. First, the authorities granted under Section 702 may only be used to target foreign persons located abroad for foreign intelligence purposes. Secondly, they may not be used to target U.S. persons anywhere in the world. Third, they may not be used to target anyone located inside the United States, regardless of their nationality. And fourth, they may not be used to target a foreign person when the intent is to acquire the communications of a U.S. person with whom a foreign person is communicating. This is generally referred to as the prohibition against reverse targeting. The third item I would like to stress is that we are committed to ensuring that the intelligence community's use of 702 is consistent with the law in the protection of the privacy and civil liberties of Americans. And to that end, in the nearly 10 years since Congress enacted the FAA, there have been no instances of intentional violations of Section 702. I'd like to repeat that. In the nearly 10 years since Congress enacted the amendments to the Freedom Act, uh, the act that established uh, FISA, there have been no instances of intentional violations of Section 702. With those points as a backdrop, now let me turn to a discussion of why it became necessary for Congress to enact Section 702. I do this so that the American public can hopefully better understand the basis for this important law. The Foreign Intelligence and Surveillance Act was first passed in 1978. 
creating a way for the federal government to obtain court orders for electronic surveillance of suspected spies, terrorists, and foreign diplomats located inside the United States. <clears throat> when originally enacting FISA, Congress decided that collection against targets located abroad would generally be outside of their regime, FISA's regime. That decision reflected the fact that people in the United States are protected by the Fourth Amendment, while foreigners located abroad are not. Congress accomplished this in large part by defining electronic surveillance based on the technology of the time. In the 1970s, overseas communication were predominantly carried by satellite. FISA, as passed in 1978, did not require a court order for the collection of these overseas satellite communications. So, for example, if in 1980 NASA intercepted a satellite communication of a foreign terrorist abroad, no court order was required. However, by 2008, technology had changed considerably. First, U.S.-based email services were being used by people all over the world. Second, the overseas communications that in 1978 were typically carried by satellite were now being carried by fiber optic cables often running through the United States. So to continue the same example, if in 2008 a foreign terrorist was communicating by using a U.S.-based email service, a traditional FISA court order was required to compel a U.S.-based company to help with that collection. Under traditional FISA, a court order can only be obtained on an individual basis by demonstrating to a federal judge that there is probable cause to believe that the target of the proposed surveillance is a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. This had become an ever more difficult and extremely resource-intensive process. And therefore, due to these changes in technology, the same resource-intensive legal process was being used to conduct surveillance on terrorists located abroad who were not protected by the Fourth Amendment, as was being used to conduct surveillance on U.S. persons inside the United States who are protected by the Fourth Amendment. By enacting 702 in 2008 and renewing it in 2012, both times with significant bipartisan support, Congress corrected this anomaly, restoring the balance of protections established by the original FISA statute. And although I will not go into great detail here regarding the legal framework for FISA Section 702, I will simply note a few key items. First, the statute requires annual certifications by the Attorney General and by the Director of National Intelligence regarding the categories of foreign intelligence that the intelligence community will acquire under this authority. Second, the statute requires targeting procedures that set forth the rules by which the intelligence community ensures that only foreign persons abroad are targeted for collection. Thirdly, the statute requires minimization procedures protecting U.S. persons' information that may be incidentally acquired while targeting foreign persons. And finally, each year, the FISA court reviews this entire package of material to make sure the government's program is consistent with both the statute and with the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. We have publicly released lightly redacted versions of all these documents, including the most recent Fisk opinion, to ensure the public has a good understanding of how we use this authority. The government's Section 702 program, as we have said, is subject to rigorous and frequent oversight by all three branches of government. The first line of oversight and compliance is within the agencies themselves, whose offices of general counsel, privacy and civil liberties offices, and inspectors general all have a role in FISA 702 program oversight. The majority of the incidents of noncompliance that are reported to my office and to the Department of Justice are self-reported by the participating agencies. In addition, the Office of the DNI and Department of Justice conduct regular audits, focusing on compliance with the targeting procedures as well as on curing, uh, querying 
of collected data and on dissemination of information under the minimization procedures. Also, we have regular engagements with an extensive reporting to Congress about the FISA 702 program. For example, the Judiciary and Intelligence Committees receive relevant orders of the FISA Court in associated pleadings, descriptions and analysis of every compliance incident, and certain statistical information such as the number of intelligence reports in which a known U.S. person was identified. And finally, of course, the FISA Court regularly checks our work, both through the annual recertification process and through regular interactions on particular incidents of noncompliance. Members of the FISA Court, who are all appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, represent the best of the best of our judicial community. They have vast judicial experience and are committed to the constitutional responsibilities of protecting the privacy of U.S. persons. We are particularly proud of our oversight and compliance track record. The audits of the program conducted by the ODNI and DOJ have shown that unintended error rates are extremely low, substantially, substantially less than 1%. Further, and I want to emphasize this, we have never, not once, found an intentional violation of this program. There have been unintended mistakes, but I would note that any system with zero compliance incidents is a broken compliance system because human beings make mistakes. The difference here is that these, none of these mistakes has been intentional. When do we, and when we do find unintentional errors and compliance incidents, we ensure that they are reported and corrected. This is an extraordinary record of success for the diligent men and women of the intelligence community who are committed to ensuring that our, their neighbor's privacy is protected in the course of their national security work. And with that, I'd like to turn to the most recent compliant incident, which resulted in a significant change in how the National Security Agency conducts as a, a portion of its FISA 702 collection. A recent example of the oversight process at work, uh, as a recent example, NASA identified a compliance incident involving queries of U.S. persons identifiers into Section 702 acquired upstream data. Upstream data refers to when NASA receives communications directly from the Internet with the assistance of companies that maintain these backbone networks. The FISC FISA court was promptly notified, and DOJ and ODNI worked with NSA to understand the scope and causes of the problem, as well as to identify potential solutions to prevent the problem from reoccurring. The details of the incident are publicly available, and Admiral Rogers will go or can go into more detail during the question and answer session if you would like. But just allow me briefly to state what happened. NASA identified and researched a compliance issue. NASA, excuse me, NSA uh, reported that issue to DOJ, ODNI, and ultimately the FISA court. The court delayed its consideration of the 2016 certifications on that basis until the government was able to correct the issue. NSA determined that a possible solution to the compliance problem was to stop conducting one specific type of upstream collection. So ultimately, we decided that the most effective way to address the court's concerns was to stop collecting on this basis. It's called the abouts portion of upstream collection. And by abouts collection, I'm referring to NSA's ability to collect communications where the foreign intelligence target is neither the sender nor the recipient of the communication that's made, but is referenced within the communication itself. The FISA court agreed with our solution and approved the program as a whole on the basis of the NSA proposal. In short, what I'm trying to say here is, is that a compliance issue was identified and after a great deal of hard work, the Department of Justice and the intelligence community proposed to the FISA court an effective solution that took the relevant collection costs and compliance benefits into account. 
and the court agreed with the proposed solution. That is how the process works, and it works well. Before I conclude, I would like to speak briefly about an issue that has been the subject of much public discussion. There have been requests, numerous requests, from both Congress and the advocacy community for NSA to attempt to count the number of United States persons whose communications have been incidentally acquired in the course of FISA 702 collection. During my confirmation hearing, and in a subsequent hearing before this committee, I committed to sitting down with Admiral Rogers and the subject matter experts in the intelligence community to understand why this has been so difficult. Within my first few weeks on the job, I visited NSA, discussed with Admiral Rogers and his technical people, uh, and followed through on my commitment. What I learned was that the NSA has made Herculean, this is hard for me to say, they have made extensive efforts. Herculean, I think, is the... Uh, is the say that again. Herculean. 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 All right. I have to turn to... Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean really tough efforts, all right? To devise a counting strategy that would be accurate and that would respond to the question that was asked. But I also learned that it remains infeasible to generate an exact, accurate, meaningful, and responsive methodology that can count how often a U.S. person's communications may be incidentally collected under 702. I want to be clear here. To determine if communicants are U.S. persons, NSA would be required to conduct significant additional research trying to determine whether individuals who may be of no foreign intelligence interest are U.S. persons. And from my perspective as the Director of National Intelligence, this raises two significant concerns. First, I would be asking trained NSA analysts to conduct intense identity verification research on potential U.S. persons who are not targets of an investigation. From a privacy and civil liberties perspective, I find this unpalatable. Second, those scores of analysis that would have to be shifted from key focus areas, such as counterterrorism, counterintelligence, counterproliferation, issues with nations in which such as North Korea, we need, and Iran, we need continuous and critical uh, intelligence missions. I can't justify such a diversion of critical resources and the mass of critical resources that we would need to try to attempt to reach this, even without the ability to reach a definite number. I can't justify that at a time when we face such a diversity of serious threats. And finally, even if we decided the privacy intrusions were justified, and if I had unlimited staff to tackle this problem, we still do not believe it is possible to come up with an accurate, measurable result. I'm aware that the Senate Intelligence Committee staff will be meeting following this public hearing in a classified session, and Admiral Rogers has instructed his experts to address this issue in greater detail. Before I wrap up my remarks, I want to provide one final example that I have, for the purposes of today's hearing, chosen to declassify using my authority as the Director of National Intelligence to further illustrate the value of Section 702. Before rising through the ranks to become at one point the second in command of the self-proclaimed Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, ISIS. Haji Iman was a high school teacher and imam. His transformation from citizen to terrorist caused the U.S. government to offer a $7 million reward for information leading to him. It also made him a top focus of the NSA's counterterrorism efforts. NSA, along with its IC partners, spent over two years from 2000. 14 to 2016, looking for Haji Iman. This search was ultimately successful, primarily because of FISA Section 702. Indeed, based almost exclusively on intelligence activities under Section 702, 
NSA collected a significant body of foreign intelligence about the activities of Haji Iman and his associates. Beginning with non-Section 702 collection, NSA learned of an individual closely associated with Haji Iman. NSA used collection permitted and authorized under Section 702 to collect intelligence on the close associates of Haji Iman, which allowed NSA to develop a robust body of knowledge concerning the personal network of, his, of Haji Iman and his close associates. Over a two-year period, using FISA Section 702 collection and in close collaboration with our IC partners, NSA produced more intelligence on Haji Iman's associates, including their location. NSA and its tactical partners then combined this information, the Section 702 collection, which was continuing, and other intelligence assets to identify the reclusive Haji Iman and track his movements. Ultimately, this collaboration enabled U.S. forces to attempt an apprehension of Haji Iman and two of his associates. On March 24, 2016, during the attempted apprehension operation, shots were fired at the U.S. forces aircraft from Haji Iman's location. U.S. forces returned fire, killing Haji Iman and the other associates at that location. Subsequent, subsequent Section 702 collection confirmed Haji Iman's death. As you can see from this sensitive example, Section 702 is an extremely valuable intelligence collection tool and one that is subject to a rigorous, effective oversight program. And therefore, allow me to reiterate my call on behalf of the intelligence community without hesitation my call for permanent reauthorization of the FISA Amendments Act without further amendment. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your patience, and we would be willing to be open to your questions. Thank you, Director Coates. Uh, the chair would recognize himself now for five minutes of questions. Um, in 2012, I mentioned in my opening statement, Director of National Intelligence Jim Clapper and Attorney General Eric Holder wrote a letter to the congressional leadership asking Congress to pass straight reauthorization of FISA. The September 2012 statement of administration policy also urged the same. This would be to Director Coates and uh, A.G. Rosenstein. Has the ODNI or the Department of Justice position changed at all since the time of the February 2012 letter? No, it's, uh, we strongly support uh, the 2012 letter and request. We agree. we agree 100 percent. Right. Um, this is to Admiral Rogers and to Director McKay. Since Congress last authorized this authority in 2012, again, have there been any instances involving a deliberate or intentional compliance violation? Admiral Rogers? Not that I'm aware of. Director McKay? No, sir. Uh, Admiral Rogers, this is to you. Sure. If FISA 702 statutory authorities were to end or even be diminished, what would be the impact on our national security? I could not generate the same level of insight that the nation, our friends and allies around the world count on with respect to counterterrorism, counterproliferation. I could not, for example, be able to recreate the insights on the Russian uh, efforts to influence the 2016 election cycle. Without 702, we could not have produced that level of insight. Um, this is a jump ball. April 26, 2017, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, commonly known as FISC, held that Section 02 certifications, including its targeting and minimization procedures, are, are lawful both under FISA statute and the Fourth Amendment. As former Director Comey testified last month, the only reason uh, our laws even require the certification to cover, and I quote, these non-Americans who aren't in our country is because their communications transiting U.S.-based networks and systems, yet others have suggested imposing a Fourth Amendment warrant requirement on foreigners who are located outside of the United States. Uh, this is really uh, NSA and justice. Would imposing such a warrant requirement impact our national security tools to protect America? Many he's referring to me. I'll be happy to take the ball. 
Uh, yes, it would, Senator. I think what's important to recognize is that uh, in the absence of Section 702, the Department of Justice and the intelligence community, in every case in which we wanted to obtain foreign intelligence information to collect and against a particular target, we'd be required to obtain a court order that would need to be supported by probable cause. Uh, the consequence of that is, number one, it'd be very time-consuming because these are very thorough investigations and we produce very lengthy documents. In fact, Director McCabe and I spent a fair amount of our time every morning uh, reviewing a stack of documents with our career agents and prosecutors uh, in which they have determined that it's appropriate to seek those orders. So it'd be time-consuming. Uh, it would uh, require a significant commitment of resources. And in addition to that, it would require a showing a probable cause. And uh, as you know, the probable cause showing, which is required under the Constitution, uh, in uh, circumstances in which privacy interests of Americans uh, are at stake and it's required by the Fourth Amendment, uh, that's a relatively higher threshold than we require for foreign intelligence information. And so we think it's important, Senator, that we not apply that Fourth Amendment constitutional standard to foreigners who are not in the United States. Thank you, Mr. Rosen. Um, Admiral Rogers, this is to you. There's a lot of news reporting, much of it inaccurate, that characterizes Section 702 as a means of targeting U.S. persons. We know that targeting U.S. persons is prohibited, as, it, as, as, as is what is termed reverse targeting. Could you explain and clarify the reverse targeting prohibition and what does it prevent the IC from targeting and collecting? So reverse targeting is designed to preclude our ability to bypass the law. And what do I mean by that? The law is expressly designed to ensure that we are not using this legal framework as a capability to target U.S. persons. Reverse targeting is the following scenario. Say we're interested in generating insight on U.S. person A. We know that we can't uh, get a Title I, we can't get a FISA warrant. So under the idea of reversal, reverse targeting, the theory would be, well, why don't you just target a foreign entity that that U.S. person talks to, and then you'll get all the insights you want on the U.S. person, but you'll have bypassed the court process, you'll have bypassed the entire legal structure. 702 specifically reminds us we cannot do that. We cannot use 702 as a vehicle to bypass other laws or to target U.S. persons. Can you, uh, last question, can you please clarify for members and for the public what's meant by incidental collection? Incidental collection, and the statute itself, if you read the law, the statute acknowledges that in the execution of this framework, we will encounter U.S. persons. We call that incidental collection. That happens under two scenarios. Number one, which is about 90% of the time, we are monitoring two foreign individuals, and those foreign entities talk about or reference a U.S. person. The second scenario that we do, that we encounter, what we call incidental collection, is we are targeting a valid foreign individual. And that valid foreign individual, a foreign intelligence target, ends up having a conversation with a U.S. person. That's not the target of our collection. It's not why we are monitoring it in the first place. We're interested in that foreign target. That happens of the times we have incidental collection. That scenario happens about 10% of the time. And were that incidental collection to happen, you have a procedure in place in both instances to minimize that? We do. The law, the law specifically gives us a set, of, a set of processes that we have to follow. So if we do encounter a U.S. person incidentally in the course of our collection, we ask ourselves several questions. Number one, are we looking at potential criminal activity? If we do that, we have a requirement to report or to inform the Department of Justice and the FBI, and they make the determination if it's illegal or not. We are an intelligence organization, not a law enforcement organization. The second question we ask ourselves, is there anything in this converse conversation that would lead us to believe that we're talking about harm to individuals? In that case, we do report. If we think we're dealing with something that is criminal or there's harm to individuals, we report it. Other than that, unless there is a valid intelligence purpose, depending on the authority, in the case of 702, we specifically purge the data. We remove it. We don't put it into our holdings. If we don't assess that there's intelligence value and it's a U.S. person, we have to purge the data. Thank you for that. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I indicated, I've got some questions on another matter. And Director Coates and Admiral Rogers, they're mostly going to be directed at 
uh, you gentlemen, and thank you for your testimony this morning. And we all know now that in March, then Director Comey testified about the existence of an ongoing FBI investigation into links between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. And there are reports out in the press that the President separately appealed to you, Admiral Rogers, and to you, Director Coates, to downplay the Russia investigation. And now we've got additional reports, and we want to give you a chance to confirm or deny these, that the President separately addressed you, Director Coates, and ask you to, in effect, intervene with Director Comey again to downplay the FBI investigation. Admiral Rogers, you draw the short straw. I'm going to start with you. Before we get to the substance of whether this call or request was made, you've had a very distinguished career, close to 40 years. In your experience, would it be in any way typical for a president to ask questions or bring up an ongoing FBI investigation, particularly if that investigation concerns associates and individuals that might be associated with the president's campaign or his activities? Was so today I am not going to talk about theoreticals. I am not going to discuss the specifics of any interaction or conversations. I may or can may you, not, can if, you if I could sorry, finish, yes, sir, please, that I may or may not have had with the president of the United States, but I will make the following comment. In the three plus years that I have been the director of the National Security Agency, to the best of my recollection, I have never been directed to do anything I believe to be illegal, immoral, unethical, or inappropriate. And to the best of my recollection, during that same period of service, I do not recall ever feeling pressured to do so. But have, in, in your course prior to the incident that we're going to discuss, was it in any regular course where a president would ask you to comment or intervene in any ongoing FBI investigation? Not talking about this circumstance, but yes, sir, any prior I'm, experience? I'm not going to talk about theoreticals today. Well, let me ask you specifically, did the president, the reports that are out there, ask you in any way, shape, or form to back off or downplay the Russian investigation. I'm not going to discuss the specifics of conversations with the President of the United States, but I stand by the comment I just made to you, sir. Is, do you feel that, that those conversations were classified? We know that this, there was an ongoing FBI investigation. Yes, sir. There are press reports. Yes, sir. Um, I understand your answer. I'm, I'm disappointed with that answer, but I may <coughs> indicate, and I... I told you I was going to bring this up, sure. there is, we have facts that there were other individuals that were aware of the call that was made to you, aware of the substance of that call, and that there was a memo prepared because of concerns about that call. Will you comment at all? I about stand the by the comments that I have made to you today, sir. So you will not confirm or deny the existence of a memo? I stand by the comments I have made to you today, sir. I think it will be essential, Mr. Chairman, that we, that other individual who's served our country as well with great distinction, who's no longer a member of the administration, uh, has a chance to relay his, his version of those facts. Again, I understand yes, sir. your position, but I hope you'll also understand the enormous need for the American public to know. You've got the administration saying there's no there there. We have these reports and yet we can't get confirmation. I want to go to you, Director Coates. Um, when you appeared before SASC, you said, and I quote, if called before the investigative committee, I certainly will provide them with what I know and what I don't know. I have great respect for you. You served on, on this committee. I remember as well when we confirmed you, and I was proud to support your confirmation, you said that you would cooperate with this committee in any aspects that we request of the Russia investigation. We now have press reports, and you can lay them the rest if they're not true, but we have press reports of not once, but twice, that the President of the United States asked you to either downplay the Russia investigation or to directly intervene with Director Comey. Can you set the record straight about what happened or didn't happen? Well, Senator, as I uh, responded uh, to a similar question uh, during my confirmation and, and uh, in a second hearing uh, before the committee, I do not feel it's appropriate for me to 
in a public session um, in which uh, confidential uh, conversations between the president and myself. I don't believe it's appropriate for me to uh, address that uh, in a public session. Gentlemen, I, I understand. I, I stated that before, and I, I, well, I thought you that. also said it, Sask. If brought before the investigative committee, you would quote certainly provide them with what I know and what I don't know. We are before that investigative committee. Well, I stand by the, my previous statement that we are in a public session here, and I do not feel that I, it's appropriate for me to address uh, confidential information. Most of the information I've shared uh, with the president obviously is directed toward intelligence matters uh, during our uh, oval briefings uh, uh, every morning at the, at the White House, or most mornings when both the president and I'm in town. Um, but for intelligence-related matters or any other matters that have been discussed, um, uh, it is my uh, belief uh, that it's inappropriate for me to uh, share that with the public. Gentlemen, I, I respect all of your service, and I understand and respect your commitment to the administration you're serving. Um, we will have to bring forward that other individual about whether the existence of the memo that uh, that may document some of the facts that took place in the conversation between the President and Admiral Rogers. But I would only ask as we go forward, um, this will be my final comment, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. Chairman, that um, we also have to weigh in here the public's absolute need to know. They're wondering what's going on. They're wondering what type of activities. We see this pattern that without confirmation or denial, appears that the president, not once, not twice, but we will hear from Director Comey tomorrow, this pattern where the president seems to want to interfere or downplay or halt the ongoing investigation, not only that the Justice Department is taking on, but this committee is taking on. And I hope as we move forward on this, you'll realize the importance that the American public deserves to get the answers to these questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator, I would like to respond to that, if, if I could. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, uh, I, I'm always, I, I told you and I committed to the committee that I would be available to uh, testify before this is the appropriate venue to do this in, given that this is an open hearing and a lot of confidential information um, relative to intelligence or other matters. Uh, I, I just don't feel it's appropriate I, for me to do that in this situation. And then secondly, um, when I was uh, asked yesterday to respond to uh, a piece that I was told was going to be written and printed in the Washington Post this morning. Uh, my response uh, to that was in uh, my time of service, which is uh, in interacting with the President of the United States uh, or anybody in his administration, I have never been pressured. I have never felt pressure uh, to uh, intervene or interfere in any way and shape with shaping intelligence in a political way uh, or um, in, in relationship all to I'd, an ongoing all I'd, investigation. All I'd say, Director Coates, is you know, there was a chance here to lay to rest some of these press reports. If the president is asking you to intervene or downplay, you may not have felt pressure, but if he's even asking, to me that is a very relevant piece of information. And again, at least in terms of the conversation with Admiral Rogers, I think we will get at least some, uh, another individual's version. But at some point, these facts have to come out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Risch. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator uh, Coates, excuse me, Director Coates and Admiral Rogers uh, for your uh, testimony. And uh, with all due respect to my colleague uh, from Virginia, I think you have cleared up uh, substantially uh, your direct testimony that you have never been pressured by anyone including the President of the United States, to do something illegal, immoral, or anything else. Thank you for that. Let's go back to, se you, let's go back to Section 702, which is what this hearing was uh, supposed to be all about. Um, it's becoming patently obvious, I think, that those of us that work in the intelligence uh, community, that we're in a different position than Europe is. Uh, Europe is, uh, their, their, their risks... Uh, are obviously very high, and they're suffering these attacks on a very regular basis and becoming more regular. So let's talk about our uh, collection efforts versus the European collection efforts, and particularly as it relates to uh, uh, Section 702. And uh, obviously, uh, we here in the media 
frequently about spats between us and the Europeans regarding uh, intelligence matters, but we all know that there is a robust communication and cooperation between our uh, European friends uh, and ourselves. So I want to talk about it uh, in, I want to talk about 702 in, in that respect. Uh, why don't we start, uh, Director Coates, with you, and then I'll, I'll throw it up for anybody else that wants to comment on this. How important is 702, uh, uh, the continuation uh, of, the, uh, of Section 702 and its uh, related parts uh, to doing what we have been doing as far as helping the Europeans and the Europeans helping us and doing the things that we're doing here in America to see that we don't have the kind of situations that have been recently happening in Europe. Director Coates, start with you. Well, having just returned uh, a few weeks ago from uh, major capitals in Europe and discussing this very issue uh, with my counterparts uh, throughout the intelligence communities of these uh, various countries. Um, they voluntarily, before I could even ask the question, uh, expressed extreme gratitude for the ability, uh, for, for the information we have been able to share with them relative to threats. Um, numerous threats have been avoided on the basis of collection that we have received through 702 th authorities and our notification of them of these impending threats, and they have been, they have been uh, deterred or, or uh, in, intercepted. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, what has happened uh, just recently, particularly in, in England, um, um, shows that um, uh, regardless of how good we are, uh, there are bad actors out there that have uh, bypassed uh, uh, the, the more concentrated uh, large attack efforts uh, and take it either through inspiration or direction uh, from ISIS or other uh, terrorist groups uh, have chosen to um, uh, take violent action against the citizens of those countries. Uh, the purpose of the trip was to ensure them that we would continue to work and share together uh, their collection activities, uh, uh, capabilities uh, in many, many cases are, are good. Uh, but in some cases lack uh, the ability that we have. And so this uh, ability to share information with them that helps keep their people safe also um, uh, is highly valued by them. But I don't think we should take for granted that just because Europe has been the recent target of uh, these attacks, that the United States uh, is safe from that. We know through intelligence that there is plotting going on, and we know that there is... Uh, uh, lone wolf issues and, and uh, individuals that are taking instructions from ISIS through social media uh, or that for whatever reason are copycatting uh, what is happening. And so um, uh, that threat exists here also. Uh, and then let me lastly say that uh, the nations I've talked to, many of which have been extremely uh, concerned about violating privacy rights have initiated new procedures and, and legislation and mandates relative to giving the intelligence ag agencies better collection because they think it, they need it uh, to protect uh, their citizens. Thank you uh, very much. In just a few uh, seconds that I've got left, Mr. Rosenstein, could you, uh, could you uh, tell me, please, uh, we're, we get a lot of pushback on, from the privacy people. Mm -hmm. And we've now heard testimony that there's been no intentional violation over the 10 years. Could you uh, uh, tell the American people what's in store for someone who these guys catch <clears throat> intentionally misusing 702, since you're uh, the highest ranking member of the Department of Justice here? Yes, Senator. <clears throat> well, I can assure you, Senator, that in the Department of Justice, uh, we treat with great uh, seriousness any allegations of violations regarding classified information. So if there were a credible allegation that someone had willfully violated Section 702 in a way that was in violation of a criminal law, uh, we would investigate that case, and if prosecution were justified, we would prosecute it. I know Director McCabe shares with me that commitment. We recognize that we have an obligation to the American people to make sure that these authorities are used appropriately and responsibly, that we comply with the Constitution and the laws and the procedures, and we're committed to devote whatever resources are required to make sure that if there are willful violations, People are held accountable for them. And this is your commitment and the Department of Justice's commitment to the American people? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Rosenstein. Thank Senator, you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Feinstein. Thanks. <clears throat> Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of comments on Section um, 
702. Um, it's a program that I support. It's a program that I believe has worked well. It's a big program. It's an important one. It is a content collection program involving both Internet and phone communications. So it can raise concerns about privacy and civil liberties. Um, in the year 2016, there were 106,469 authorized targets out of 3 billion Internet users. That's the ratio. Uh, the question of unmasking has been raised. Um, it's my understanding that 1,939 U.S. person identities were unmasked in 2016 based on collection that occurred under Section uh, 702. Uh, so my question is going to be the following, and I'll ask it all together, and hopefully you'll, you'll answer it. Um, I would like a description of the certification process and the use of an amicus. Um, I would like your response to the fact that uh, the question, uh, the, the program uh, sunsets after five years, about raising that sunset versus no sunset because of the uh, privacy concerns. It's my belief there should be uh, a sunset. And the use of an amicus, which ha is currently used as part of the certification process, and whether that should be continued and formalized. So, Admiral, it's programs under your office. I, I could. If I could, DOJ is going to be smarter on the amicus okay. piece, please. Will you take that piece and all? I'm not sure I am smarter on the amicus piece, Senator. I can tell you this, though, that uh, um, with regard to the question of unmasking, you know, this is actually primarily a question not for the department. The determination is made by the intelligence agencies. Uh, if there is uh, a situation where uh, a foreign person has been communicating about an American person, uh, and a decision is made whether or not the identity of the American person is necessary in order for that intelligence to be properly used. I think what's important for people to recognize, Senator, is that's an internal issue. That is, that unmasking is done internally you know, within the, the cloak of uh, confidentiality within the intelligence community. Uh, that's a different issue from leaks. In other words, if, if somebody's identity is disclosed internally because it's relevant for uh, intelligence purposes, uh, because that's the goal of this collection, is to understand... Mr. Rosenstein, I, let me just tell you, I, I just listened to somebody who should have known better talking about unmasking in a political sense, that it's done politically. And that, of course, is not the case. And so what I'm looking for is the definition of how this is done and under what circumstances. Right. And, and I, I think, Senator, that the, because that's really a decision made by the IC, the that. intelligence community, not by the department, it would be appropriate for them to respond to that. I, I could do that. So with respect to unmasking, the following criteria is apply. First, for the National Security Agency, we define in writing who has the authority to unmask a U.S. person identity. That is 20 individuals in 12 different positions. I am one of the 20 in one of those 12 positions, the director. Secondly, we outline in writing what are the criteria that will be applied to a request to unmask. In a report, and again, part of our process under 702 to protect the identity of U.S. persons as part of our minimization procedures, when we think we need to reference a U.S. person in a report, we will not use a name. We will not use an identity. We say U.S. person one, U.S. person two, U.S. person three. That report is then promulgated. Some of the recipients of that report will sometimes come back to us and say, I'm trying to understand what I am reading. Could you help me understand who is person one or who is person two, etc.? We apply two criteria in response to their request. Number one, you must make the request in writing. Number two, the request must be made on the basis of your official duties, not the fact that you just find this report really interesting and you're just curious. It has to tangibly tie to your job. And then finally, I said too, but there's a third criterion, and that is the basis of the request must be that you need this identity to understand the intelligence you're reading. We apply those three criteria, we do it in writing, and one of those 20 individuals then agrees or disagrees. And if we unmask, 
we go back to that entity who requested it, not every individual who received the report, but that one entity who asked for us, we then provide them the U.S. identity, and we also remind them the classification of this report and the sensitivity of that identity remains in place. By revealing this U.S. person to you, we are doing it to help you understand the intelligence, not, not so that you can use that knowledge indiscriminately. It must remain appropriately protected. Thank you. And, Senator, if I could just add something to that. Given the nature of this issue, and it's a legitimate question that, that you've asked, uh, I've talked with um, uh, my colleagues uh, at uh, NSA and CIA, FBI, and so forth, and suggesting that we might ask our civil liberties uh, and privacy protection uh, uh, agencies to take a look at this, uh, to see if they're Admiral Rogers laid out the procedures. Are these the right procedures? Should we be doing something different? Would they have recommendations that better protected uh, people from misuse of this? Uh, so, and they've all agreed to do that. So I think it's a legitimate issue to follow up on. I've talked to the agency heads about doing so, and they're willing to do it. And if I could, I also have an internal review that I have directed. Given all the attention, given the focus, let's step back, let's reassess it, and let's ask ourselves, is there anything that would suggest we need to do something different in the process? Good, good. Thank M you. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to uh, more thoroughly answer the first question the Senator asked, which is, Senator Feinstein, my understanding is that an amicus was used in 2015. Uh, uh, that decision was made by the court. It's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which has the statutory authority, if the court believes it's appropriate in a particular case, to appoint an amicus. So my understanding is that that was done in 2015. Thank you. Well, would, would you feel it would be helpful to make it a part of the regular certification process? Well, my understanding, Senator, is that the statute permits the court to do it if the court believes it's appropriate. So I believe the court has that authority. Uh, and uh, I'd leave it to the judges to decide when it's appropriate to exercise that. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chief. Senator Rubio. Thank you all for being here. Um, I understand fully the need of the President of the United States to be able to have conversations uh, with members of the intelligence community that are protected, particularly in a classified setting. I also understand that the ability of this community to function depends both on its credibility, that its work that it's doing is in the national security interest of the United States, and also the importance of its independence, that it is not an extension of politics no matter which administration is at play. In the absence of either one of those two things, uh, impacts everything we do, including this debate we're having here today. And the challenge that we have now is that while the folks here with us this morning are uh, constrained in what they can say, there are people that work, apparently work for you, that are not, and are constantly speaking to the media about things and saying things. And it puts the Congress in a very difficult position, because the issue of oversight on both your independence and on your credibility falls on us. And... Um, and I actually think if what is being said to the media is untrue, then it is unfair to the President of the United States. And if it is, then it is, some, that it is true that it is something the American people deserve to know and we as an oversight committee need to know in order to conduct our job. And so my questions are geared to Director Coates and Admiral Rogers. You have testified that you have never felt pressured or threatened by the President or by anyone to influence any ongoing investigation by the FBI. Are you prepared to say that you have never felt that you've never been asked by the President or the White House to influence an ongoing investigation? Well, Senator, I just hate to keep repeating this, but I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm willing to come before the committee and tell you what I know and what I don't know. What I'm not willing to do is to share what I think is confidential information that ought to be protected uh, in an open hearing. And so I'm not prepared to, to answer your question uh, today. Uh, and Dr. I, Dr. Coates, I, I would just say, and, and with incredible respect that I have for you, I am not asking for classified information. I am asking whether or not uh, you have ever been asked by anyone to uh, influence an ongoing investigation. I understand, but I'm just not going to go down that road uh, okay, I, 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 uh, to, in, in, a, in a public uh, forum. And uh, I, I also was asked the question uh, uh, if the special prosecutor called upon me to uh, uh, meet with him to uh, uh, ask his questions, I said I would be willing to do that. I likewise stand by my previous comment. Okay, well then, in the interest of time, let me ask both of you, has anyone ever asked you, now or in the past, this administration or any administration, to issue a statement that you knew to be false? 
for me, I stand by my previous statement. I've never been directed to do anything in the course of my three plus years as the director of the National Security Not directed, Agency asked. that I felt to be inappropriate, nor have I felt pressured to do so. Have you ever been asked to say something that isn't true? I stand by my previous statement, sir. Director Coates? I do likewise. Well, let me ask this of everyone on this panel. Is anyone aware of any effort by anyone in the White House or elsewhere to seek advice on how to influence any investigation? Uh, my answer is absolutely no, Senator. <clears throat> no one has anything to add to that. I don't understand the question. The question is, are you aware of any efforts by anyone in the White House or the executive branch looking for advice from other members of the intelligence community about how to potentially influence an investigation? Are you talking about me? No. No. Okay. Uh, who wants to answer? I'm sorry. I'm not sure I understand the question, but if you're asking whether we, I'm aware of requests to other people in the intelligence community, I am not. I'm seeking advice on how we could potentially influence someone. You're not aware of not anyone aware ever of saying or reporting that to you? No, sir. Has anyone ever come forward and said, I just got a call from someone at the White House asking me what is the best way to influence someone on, on an investigation? Let's come here. I've, I've never received anything. I have no direct knowledge of such a call. It was an allegation made in one of the press reports, and that's why I asked. On a separate topic, I'm sorry, who does? I, 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 our confusion center, we just want to make sure we're clear on the question. The, the answer is no, as I understand it, but I'm not sure I'm familiar with the particular media report that you're referring to. All right. I'm running out of time. I do want to ask this because this is important. Did the NSA <coughs> routinely and extensively and repeatedly violate uh, the rules that were put in place in 2011 uh, to minimize the risk of uh, <clears throat> collection of upstream information. Have we had compliance incidents? Yes. Have we reported every one of those to the court? Yes. Have we reported those to our congressional oversight in Congress? Yes. Have we reported those to the Department of Justice and the Director of National Intelligence? Yes. Did, uh, under the Obama <clears throat> administration, was there a significant uptick in efforts and incidents of unmasking from 2012 to 2016? I don't know that. I have to take that for the record. Know that. To be honest, I, I, we have the data, but I don't know that off the top of my head. I couldn't tell you unmasking on a year-by-year -year basis for the last five years. I apologize. I just don't know off, off the top you. of my head. Thank you. Senator Wyden. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I've noted the conversations you've had with my colleagues with respect to the content of conversations that you may have had with the president. My question is a little different. Did any of you four write memos, take notes, or otherwise record yours or anyone else's interactions with the president related to the Russia investigation? I don't take any notes. <laughs> let's, go. Let's, let's just get the four of you on the record. Uh, Senator, I rarely take notes. I've actually taken a few today. Uh, but I am not going to answer questions concerning the Russia investigation. I think it's important for you to understand. Uh, when I, not on whether you wrote a memo. I'm, I'm not going to answer any questions okay. about the, the uh, Russia My time's going to be short. Whether you wrote a memo, notes, anything. I, I also am not going to comment on any conversations I may have had or notes taken or not taken relative to the Russia investigation. Okay. And the likewise, I take the same position. Director Coates, on March 23rd, you testified to the Armed Services Committee that you were not aware of the president or White House personnel contacting anyone in the intelligence community with a request to drop the investigation into General Flynn. Yesterday, the Washington Post reported that you had been asked by the president to intervene with Director Comey to back off of the FBI's focus on General Flynn. Which one of those is accurate? Uh, Senator, I'm... We'll say once again, I'm, I'm not going to get into any discussion on that in an open hearing. Both of them can't be accurate, Mr. Director. Mr. Director, as recently as April, you promised Americans that you would provide what you called a relevant metric for the number of law-abiding Americans who were swept up in the FISA 702 searches. This morning, you went back on that promise. And you said that even putting 
together a sampling, a statistical estimate, would jeopardize national security. I think that is a very, very damaging position to stake out. We're going to battle it out in the course of this because there are a lot of Americans who share our view that security and liberty are not mutually exclusive. We can have both. And you rejected that this morning. You went back on a pledge, and I think it is damaging to the public. Now, let me... Senator, my, could, I, could I answer the question? Mr. Director, my time is short, and I want to ask you about one other seven... Well, I would like to answer your question. Briefly. What I pledged to you in my confirmation hearing is that I would make every effort to try to find out why we were not able to come to a specific number of collection on U.S. persons. I told you I would con consult with Admiral Rogers. I told you I would go to the National Security, Security Agency to try to determine whether or not it, I was able to do that. I went out there. I talked to them. They went through the technical details. There were extensive efforts on the part of, uh, I learned, on the parts of NSA to try to come to, to get get you an appropriate answer. We were not Mr. able Director, to do that. Respectfully, that's not what you said. You said, and I quote, we are working to produce a relevant metric. Now let me go to my other we were, question. But we were not able to do it, to right. achieve it. You so told, working to do it is different than doing it. You told the American people that even a statistical sample would be jeopardizing America's national security. That is inaccurate and, I think, detrimental to the cause of ensuring we have both security and liberty. Now, here's my other question. We are trying to sort out Can the who, the targets, who are the targets. Apparently not. Who are the targets of a 702 investigation? Director Comey gave three different answers in a hearing a month ago. And I think it would be very helpful if you would tell us who, in fact, is a target of these investigations. I want to go after serious foreign threats, but we don't know as of now, with Director Comey uh, having given three different answers, who the targets are. Uh, Mr. Director. Well, I can't speak for Director uh, Palmer, Director Clapper. Uh, targets, as I understand, are uh, uh, non-U.S. persons, foreign individuals, are the targets in terms uh, 702 is directed and, ex and prohibited from directing targets on U.S. persons. My, my time is up. I will tell you, Director Comey gave three answers. He finally said I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I think it's confined to counterterrorism, to espionage, and finally he said he didn't think a diplomat could be targeted. So we need you all, in addition to protecting the liberties of the American people, to tell us who the targets are. Thank well, you, the, I, I would like to respond to that by saying some of those targets are classified, highly classified. I understand that. Some of those targets, by revealing those names of those targets, uh, 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 release the methods that we use uh, and then it's turned against us and uh, could cost the, the lives uh, or put some of our agents in Director significant... Director Comey listed a number of targets, which is why there's confusion. He said that on the record. We need you to tell us on the record as well, consistent with protecting sources and methods. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Coates, first let me thank you for a very cogent explanation of Section 702 and the fact that it cannot be used to target any person located in the United States, whether or not that person is an American. I think there's a lot of confusion about Section 702, and I appreciate your clear explanation thank this you. morning. I have a question for each of you that I would like to ask, and I want to start with Admiral Rogers. Admiral Rogers, did anyone at the White House direct you on how to respond today or to, uh, were there discussions of executive privilege? 
Have I asked the White House, is it their intent to invoke executive privilege? Yes. The answer I gave you today reflects my answer. No one else's. What were you passing that? Director Coates. My, exa uh, uh, my answer is exactly the same. I did never say that. Uh, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein. I have not had any communications with the White House about invoking executive privilege today. Director McKay. I have not had any conversations with the White House about executive privilege today either. That's Admiral Rogers, in January, the FBI, the CIA, and NSA jointly issued an Intelligence Committee assessment on Russian involvement in the presidential elections. The, you've testified today that the IC relied in part on 702 authorities to support its conclusion that the Russians were involved in trying to influence the 2016 elections. Can you provide us with an update on the NSA's further work in this area? In terms of the Russian uh, efforts, large? Yes, yes ma'am. Um, we continue to focus analytic and collection effort trying to generate insights as, as to what the Russians and others are doing, uh, particularly with respect to efforts against U.S. infrastructure, U.S. processes like elections. We continue to generate insights on a regular basis. If my memory is right, I testified before the SISI. We, all, we did uh, open threat assessment, and in that hearing, which I think was the 11th of May, I reiterated, we continue to see this similar activity that we identified and highlighted in the January report. Those trends continue. Much of that activity continues. It's my understanding that President Obama requested the report that was issued in January. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. He asked for a consolidated single input from the IC as to the question, did the Russians or did they not attempt to influence the U.S. election process? So could you explain the difference between the requests from President Obama for that unclassified assessment and the allegations that President Trump requested that you publicly report on whether or not there was any intelligence that concerning collusion between the Russians and the members of the Trump campaign, President Trump's campaign. So I apologize. I guess I'm confused by the question. Again, I'm not going to comment on any interactions with the president. Um, I just don't feel that 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 is appropriate. As I previously testified, I stand by that report. L let me ask a broader question yep. that I truly am trying to get a handle on. And that is, how does the <coughs> intelligence community reach a decision on whether or not to comply with a request that comes from the President of the United States? Obviously, you report to the President of the United States. and. I'm interested in what process you go through to decide whether or not to undertake a task that's been assigned by the president, by any president. So off the top of my head, I would say we comply unless we have reason to believe that we are being directed to do something that is illegal, immoral, or unethical. In Thank which you. case, we will not execute that. Senator Heinrich. Director uh, McCabe. Did, um, did Director Comey ever share details of his conversations with the President with you? In particular, uh, did Director Comey say that the President had asked for his loyalty? Sir, I'm not going to comment on conversations the Director may have had with the President. I know he's here to testify in front of you tomorrow. You'll have an opportunity to ask him those things. Well, I, I'm asking you, did you have that conversation with Director Comey? And I've responded that I'm not going to comment on those conversations. Why not? Uh, because for two reasons. First, um, the, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not in a position to talk about conversations that Director Comey may or may not have had with the President. I'm not asking you that. I'm asking about conversations that you had with Director Comey. Um, and I think that those matters also begin to fall within the scope of, of uh, issues being investigated by the Special Counsel, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on those today. So you're not invoking executive privilege, and obviously it's not classified. This is the Oversight Committee. Why would it not be appropriate for you to share that conversation with us? I think I'll let Director Comey speak for himself tomorrow in front of this committee. We certainly look forward to that, but I think you're 
your unwillingness to share that conversation is, uh, is an issue. Uh, Director Coates, you've said as well that it would be inappropriate to answer a simple question about whether the President asked for your assistance in blunting the Russia investigation. I, I don't care how you felt. I'm not asking whether you felt pressured. Uh, I'm simply asking, did that conversation occur? And uh, once again, uh, Senator, I will uh, say that I, I do believe it's inappropriate for me to discuss that in an open session. You realize, uh, and, and obviously this is not uh, releasing any classified information, but you realize how simple it would simply be to say, no, that never happened. Why is it inappropriate, Director Coates? I think conversations between the President and myself um, are for the most part. Um, you seem to apply that standard selectively. No, I'm not applying it selectively. I, I'm, I'm just saying I don't think it's appropriate. You can clear an awful lot up by simply I saying I, that never I, happened. I don't share, I do not share with the general public conversations that I have with the President or um, uh, many of my colleagues uh, within the administration that I believe are, um, should not be shared. Well, I think your unwillingness to answer a very basic question speaks volumes. It's, it's just, it's not a matter of unwillingness. Mr. Uh, Rosen, it's a matter it is a matter of where, unwillingness. It's a matter of how I share it and where, whom I share it to. And when there are ongoing investigations, I think it's inappropriate to So you don't think the American people deserve to know the answer to that question? I think the investigations will determine that. And uh, you're part Mr. Of the Rosenstein? Did you know when you wrote the memo that was used as the primary justification for firing Director Comey uh, that the administration would be using it as the primary justification? Senator, as I know you're aware, I have uh, there are a number of documents uh, associated with me that are in the public record. Uh, the memorandum I wrote uh, concerning Director Comey is in the public record. Uh, the order appointing the special counsel is in the public record. The press release I issued accompanying that order is in the public record. and. Uh, a written version of the statement that I delivered to Were you one, aware that it would be United the primary senators, justification for his firing? Pardon me, Senator. One, 100 United States Senators and 435 congressmen is in the public record. I answered uh, many questions in the closed briefings of the 100 senators. But you're not answering this question. Uh, and as I explained in those briefings, Senator, uh, I, I support uh, Mr. McCabe on this. We have a special counsel who is investigating uh, now responsible okay. for the Russian At this point, you filibuster better than most of my colleagues. So I'm going to move on to another question and say that given uh, that the president stated that the FBI director, uh, that his firing was in response to investigations into Russia, which he made very clear in Lester Holt's interviews, um, you've talked with both the president and the attorney general about this firing. In light of Mr. Sessions' recusal, what role did the Attorney General play in that firing, and was it appropriate for him to write the letter that he wrote in this case? I'm not trying to filibuster, Senator. I think I only took about 30 seconds, but uh, I, I am not going to comment on that matter. Uh, I'm going to leave it to Special Counsel Mueller to determine whether that is within the scope of his investigation, uh, and I believe that's appropriate for Mr. McCabe and me to do that. Okay, uh, so you can't comment on recusal and what's in and inside and outside the scope of that recusal. Mr. Chairman, we ought to let the witness answer the question. Second the motion. So, uh, I'm sorry, your specific question is what's in the recusal? And my understanding is the recusal you're referring to is also in the public record, and I believe it speaks for itself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Blunt. Uh, Director McCabe, on um, May the 11th, when you were before this committee, uh, you said that... Uh, there has been no effort to impede the Russian investigation. Is that still your position? <clears throat> it is, but let me clarify, Senator. I think you're referring to the exchange that I had with Senator Rubio. Uh, and my understanding, uh, at least my intention in providing that answer, was whether or not the firing of Director Comey had had a negative impact on our investigation. And my response was then and is now that the FBI investigated and continues to investigate, and now, of course, under the rubric of the special counsel, the Russia investigation uh, in an appropriate and unimpeded way, before Director Comey was fired and since he's been gone. 
Well, I think as I recall that conversation, it was a discussion about whether there were plenty of resources, whether the funding was adequate, and what you were reported to have said, I haven't looked at the exact transcript, but I have looked at the news article, was that you were aware of no effort to impede the Russian investigation. We did talk about resource issues and whether or not we had asked for additional resources to pursue the investigation. And I believe my response at the time was we had not asked for additional resources and that we had adequate resources to pursue the investigation. That was true then, is still true today. And you would characterize your quote as no effort to impede the Russian investigation as still accurate? That's correct. On the 702 issue, when, when the FBI wants to, <coughs> wants to follow up on or pursue a U.S. person in or outside the United States, what court do you go to to get that to happen? Do you go to the FISA court as well? If we are seeking sev collection under 702? No, if, well, if you're, uh, how, how do you relate to 702? Do you ever seek s collection under 702? Sure, yes we do. So when, the, well, so let me step back um, just a minute. So of course, when the FBI seeks electronic surveillance collection on a U.S. person, we go to the FISA court and get a Title I FISA uh, order to do so. If we have an, a, an open, full investigation on a foreign person in a foreign place, and the collection is to, for the purpose of collecting foreign intelligence, we can nominate that person or that, as we refer to it internally, the selector, whether it's an email address or that sort of thing, we can nominate that for 702 coverage. We convey that nomination to the NSA and they pursue the coverage under their authority. But you would be the person that would pursue coverage for a U.S. person either here or outside the United States. That's correct, Senator. We you are the FBI. We are the U.S. person agency. That's right. And um, Admiral Rogers, Senator Feinstein mentioned that last year 1,139 U.S. persons were, the phrase we're using now, unmask for some purpose. Is that a number you agree with? It's in the 2016 ODNI uh, generated transparency report. From memory, the number is actually 1,934 from memory. I uh, could I'm be sorry. wrong. But. So I, I misheard, but 1,900. What would the number have been in 2015? To be honest, I, I don't know. I'd have to take that one for the record. I, know, I do know that we didn't start um, with the, the transparency commitment that we made partnering with the DNI, we didn't start that until the latter end of 2015. So the 2015 data that's been published as a matter of public record is a subset of the entire calendar year. 2016 is the first calendar year where we have published all the data for the entire Director year. Director Coach, do you have any information on that? Well, I, I've seen the number. I don't recall what it was, and I just asked my staff. Right, I guess what I'm, what I'm asking, and we can, you can take this for the record, is was there an increase in 2016? Did you have significantly more requests based on your subset in 15 happen in 16 than you had had? Uh, than you had had. Before. I don't know off the top of my head. We'll take it for the record, but I will say this: 702 collection has continued. The amount of total collection has increased generally every year. It's more and more impactful for us. It generates more and more value. And when you have, when 702 generates information that would indicate there was a U.S. person involved in a in criminal activity, what do you do with that information? If we become, we report it to either uh, to DOJ and the FBI because we're not a, a criminal organization. And what, what do you do if you get that information at DOJ, Mr. Rosenstein? <laughs> Information from a 702 collection that we become clearly indicates there's a crime involving a U.S. person. I, I hesitate only because that's actually an FBI issue, so I would All defer right. to Mr. McCabe. Mr. McCabe. Sure. So we take that referral, and if that's a U.S. person, we begin uh, to build an investigation aiming towards <laughs> Title I FISA collection. With adequate protections for U.S. persons and that of entire course. chain of uh, transmission of, of, of material. That's right. Thank you, Chairman. Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First on 702, like uh, Senator Feinstein, I want to express my support for this important tool for our intelligence agencies. I do have a concern which we can discuss perhaps in closed session about the, uh, the process by which American uh, 
names which are incidentally collected are then queried. I'm concerned by the distinction between query and search and where we run into the Fourth Amendment. Uh, it, it strikes me as bootstrapping to say we collected it legally under 702, and then we can go and look at these American uh, persons. And I'm, I, I believe that the Fourth Amendment imposes a, uh, a warrant requirement in between that step, which is not present in the present process. We can discuss that at greater length. Uh, Mr. McCabe, I, I'm, I'm puzzled by your refusal to answer Senator Heinrich's question about a conversation you may have had with Director Comey. What's the basis of your refusal to answer that question? Sir, as I stated, I think first, uh, I, I, I can't sit here and tell you whether or not that those conversations that you're referring to. Why not? Do you not remember them? No, no, I'm sorry, sir. I can't, I don't know whether conversations in, along the lines that you've described fall within the purview of what the special counsel is now investigating. Is there some prohibition in the law that I'm not familiar with that you can't discuss an item and uh, uh, that you've been asked directly a question? It would not be appropriate for me, sir, to discuss issues that are potentially within the purview of the special counsel's investigation. And that's the basis of your refusal to answer this question? Yes, sir. And that and knowing, of course, that Director Comey will be sitting so behind you, the table So it's your tomorrow. position that the special counsel is entitled to ask you questions about this, but not a con a, a, an oversight committee of the United States Congress? It is my position that I have to be particularly careful about not stepping into the special counsel's lane, as they have now been authorized by the Department of Justice I don't understand why the special counsel's lane matters. takes precedence over the lane of the United States Congress and an investigative and oversight committee. Can you explain that distinction? Why does the special counsel get deference and not this committee? Sir, I'd be happy Is to... Is there some legal basis for that distinction? I would be happy to take that matter back to discuss it more fully with my general counsel and with the department, but right now that's the... On the record, I would like a legal justification for your refusal to answer the question today because I think it's a straightforward question. Mm -hmm. It's not involving discussions with the president. It's involving discussions with Mr. Comey. The gentleman, Mr. Uh, Director Coates and, and uh, uh, Admiral Rogers... Uh, I think you testified, Admiral Rogers, that you did discuss today's testimony with someone in the White House. I said I asked, uh, what, did the White House intend to evoke executive privileges associated with any interactions between myself and the President of the United States? And what was the answer to that question? I, to be honest, I didn't get a definitive answer, and both myself and the DNI are still talking to so the White House. So then I'll General ask both House. of you the same question. Why are you not answering these questions? Is there an invocation by the President of the United States of executive privilege? Is there or not? Not that I'm aware of. Then why are you not answering because our questions? Because I feel questions? it is inappropriate, Senator. I, what you feel isn't relevant, Admiral. What's, I, what, what you feel isn't the answer. The I answer is why are you not answering the questions? Is it an invocation of executive privilege? If there is, then let's know about it. If there isn't, answer the questions. I stand by the comments I've made. I'm not interested in repeating myself, sir. And I don't mean that in, in, a, in, a, in a contentious way. Well, I do mean it in a contentious yes, way. I don't understand why you're not answering our questions. You can't, when, when you were, when you were uh, confirmed before the Armed Services Committee, you took an oath. Do you solemnly swear to give the committee the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. You answered I do. yes to that. And I've also answered that those conversations were classified, and it is not appropriate in an open forum to discuss those classified conversations. What is classified about a conversation involving whether or not you should intervene in the FBI investigation? Sir, I stand by my previous comments. Mr. Coates, same series of questions. What's the basis for your refusal to answer these questions today? Uh, the basis is the, what I've uh, previously explained. I do not believe it is appropriate for me to What's the Get basis? I'm not satisfied with I do not believe it is appropriate or I do not feel I should answer. I want, to, uh, I want to understand a legal basis. You swore that oath to tell us the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and today you are refusing to do so. What is the legal basis for your refusal to testify to this committee? I'm not sure I have a legal basis, but I, I'm more than willing to sit before this committee and in this, in, during its investigative process in a closed session and answer your questions. Well, we're going to be having a closed session in a few hours. Do you commit to me that you're going to answer these questions in a direct and un, unencumbered way? Well, uh, that, that closed session you're going to have in a few hours uh, involves uh, the staff 
going over the technicalities of a number of these issues and doesn't involve us. But I, well, I, is it your testimony that you when you are before this committee in a closed session, you will answer these questions directly and unequivocally and without hesitation? I, I plan to do that, but I do have I do have to work through the uh, legal counsel at the White House relative to whether or not they're going to exec exercise uh, executive. Uh, Admiral Rogers, will you answer these questions in a closed session? I likewise respond as the DNI has. I certainly hope that that is what happens. I believe that's the appropriate thing. But I do have to acknowledge, because of the sensitive nature and the executive privilege aspects of this, I need to be talking to the general counsel in the White House. I hope we come to a position where we can have this dialogue. I welcome that dialogue, sir. I hope so, too. And I would just add, in conclusion, that both of you testified you had never been pressured under three years. I would argue that you have waived executive privilege by, in effect, testifying as to something that didn't happen. And uh, I believe you opened the door to these questions. And I, 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 it is my belief that you are inappropriately refusing to answer these questions today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I turn to Senator Lankford, let me say that the Vice Chairman and I have had conversations with Acting Attorney General Rosenstein when um, a special counsel was named. And as I had shared with the members of this committee prior to that, that as we carried out an investigation, there would come a point in time either with an investigation that was currently ongoing at the FBI or if there was a special counsel with the special counsel where there would be avenues that this committee could not explore. And it was my hope that uh, already the vice chair and I would have had that conversation with the special counsel. We have not. Uh, we've made the request. We intend to have it. And uh, I think that uh, uh, both of us anticipated that we would reach this point uh, at, at some point in the investigation. We, we are there where there are some things that will uh, fall into uh, the special counsel and or an active investigation, Vice let, Chairman. Let me just say, though, that at this point, we've not had that conversation with Mr. Mueller. We've not been waved off on any subject. And the way I'm hearing all of you gentlemen is that Mr. Mueller has not waved you off from answering any of these questions. Is that correct? I've had no conversations with Mr. Mueller. I, I, I've been out, out of the country for just, the last just, nine days, and I haven't had have, an Have any of you had, because if you've not had questions uh, waved off with Mr. Mueller, I think, um, frankly, and I understand your commitment to the administration, but that Senator King, Senator Heinrich, and my questions deserve answers, and at some point the American public deserves full answers. I'm going to ask Mr. Rosenstein to address that. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm, I'm sensitive to your desire to keep our answers brief, and my full answer actually would be very lengthy. Uh, but my brief answer, from my perspective with the Department of Justice, and I've been there for 27 years, and Mr. McCabe also is a career employee of the Department of Justice, our default position is that when there's a Justice Department investigation, we do not discuss it publicly. Uh, that's our default rule, so nobody needs to... Is that the rule for the President of the United States as well? I, I, don't, I don't know what... Uh, because that is what the mind. questions are being asked about. Reports that nobody, nobody has laid the rest here, that the President of the United States has intervened directly in an ongoing FBI investigation, and we've gotten no answer from any of you. And frankly, we've at least heard from Director Coates and Admiral Rogers that they've not been asked to recuse an answer because of Director Mueller. And I don't understand why we can't get that answer. So I'm not answering for uh, uh, Director Rogers or Director Coates. I'm answering for Director K. McCabe and myself uh, with regard to the Department of Justice. Senator Langford. Treasurer McCabe, can I ask you, uh, do you feel confident at this point the FBI is fully cooperating with the special counsel for any request uh, in communication and setting up of the coordination between the offices for documents, work products, uh, insight, uh, anything the special counsel, as they're trying to get organized and get and get uh, uh, prepared for the investigations they're taking on, is everyone in the FBI fully cooperating with the special counsel? Absolutely, sir. I'm absolutely confident of that. We have a robust relationship with the special counsel's office, and we are supporting them with personnel and resources uh, in any way they request. Thank you, Admiral Rogers. This spring, NSA decided to stop doing about queries. 
Uh, that was a long conversation that's happened there. It's now come out in the public about that conversation, uh, that that was identified as a problem. The court agreed with that, and that has been stopped. What I need to ask you is, who first identified that as a problem? Um, the National Security Agency did. Okay, so how did you report that, reported that to who? How did that conversation go once you identified we, we're uncomfortable with this type? So in 2016, I had directed our Office of Compliance, let's do a fundamental baseline review of compliance associated with 702. Okay. We completed that effort. My memory is I was briefed on something like October the 20th. That led me to believe the technical solution that we put in place is not working with the reliability that's necessary here. I then, from memory, and had through, went to the Department of Justice and then on to the FISA court at the end of October. I think it was something like the 26th of October, and we informed the court we have a compliance issue here, and we're concerned that it, there's an underlying um, issue with the technical solution we've put in place. We told the court we we're going to need some period of time to work our way through that. The court granted us that time. In, ex in return, the court also said, we will allow you to continue 702 under the 16 authorizations, but we will not, will not reauthorize 17 until you show us that you have addressed this. We then went through a, a, an internal process, interacted with the Department of Justice as well as the court. And by March, we had come to a solution that the FISA court was comfortable with. The court then authorized us to execute that solution and also then granted us authority for the 17702 effort. So you reported initially to the court, this is an issue, or the court initially came to you and said, we have an issue. I went to the court and said, we have an issue. And the court said, we agree, we have a problem as well. Jack. And then it got held up, went through the process of review, and then the court uh, is now signed off on the other 16. That is correct. So how, how does this harm your collection capabilities to be able to not do the about collections? So I, I acknowledge that in doing this, we, we were going to lose some intelligence value. But my concern was I just felt it was important. We needed to be able to show that we are fully compliant with the law. And the technical solution we had put in place, I just didn't think was generating the level of reliability. Um, and as a result of that, I said... We need to make the change. I will say this, and the FISA's court opinion also says the same thing. I also told the court at the time, if we can work that technical solution in a way it generates greater reliability, I would potentially come back to the Department of Justice and the court to recommend that we reinstitute it. In fact, the court acknowledged that in their certification. When you say greater reliability, tell me what you mean by that. Because it was generating errors. Our, our Office of In Compliance highlighted the, the specific number of cases in 2016. Um, and I thought to myself, clearly it's not working as we think it is. Um, we were doing queries unknowingly to the operator in a handful of, of situations um, against U.S. persons. And I just said, hey, that is not in accordance with the intent of the law. Yeah, well, clearly, clearly it's not not only the intent, it's the actual statute correct, itself. Correct, right. The statute, that, uh, the, right? The, that we uh, protect U.S. persons from yes, this is uh, foreign directed. Uh, so what I'm hearing from you is the accountability system worked. Yes, sir. That the issue rose up. We're collecting. We do have information on U.S. persons. We don't want to get that information. Uh, immediately the process started going through to be able to stop it. The court then put the final stop on it. It was corrected, and then that's now cleared. Yes, sir. And in fact, we're purging the data as well. Not only if we stopped doing it, but we're purging the data that we had collected under the previous authorization. So the issue on 702, uh, m most Oklahomans that I interact with don't know the term 702. But it, if I ask them, should we collect information on terrorist organizations and terrorists overseas who are planning to carry out attacks on us and our allies, they don't hesitate. They say, absolutely, we should do that. Now, they don't want collection on themselves and their mom, but they absolutely want us to be able to target terrorists. And so the issue that I think we talk about when we talk about 702 on this dais is a normal conversation back home that if we miss something internationally, everyone says, I thought we were doing this. Why aren't we? Uh, so I fully appreciate the civil liberties conversation and the privacy questions. Those are things I'm also passionate about. And it's very interesting for me to be able to hear from you that you're passionate about and NSA is passionate about to make sure that we're not collecting on Americans. Uh, so I appreciate that. And in this case, when it comes out in the public media that this has occurred, it actually shows the system itself worked. 
when there was a query going on that was collecting on Americans, it was stopped immediately, data is purged. But we're still continuing to be able to target on threats internationally. And I do appreciate that. Thank you. I, I appreciate you back the time. Senator Branch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all four of you for your service. And uh, you all are held at the highest, I think, the highest regards by your, uh, by your colleagues and your peers. And I think that speaks volumes of the character of all four of you. And I appreciate that very much. We have a committee here, which I'm so proud to be service. I'm, I'm brand new on the committee. This is my first, my first time at this. And uh, I don't think there's a person up here that doesn't want to find out the facts and the truth and be able to go back home and explain to the Democrat and Republican colleagues, and no matter what political persuasion, that we have gotten the facts. We got it from our intel, which we truly appreciate and respect the quality of job and work that you do. And this is our findings. We're having a hard time getting there, as you can tell, and I respect where you all are coming from. Um, and uh, I hope you could understand that, that sooner or later we're going to have to. There has to be one element of this government that the public can look at and say, this is not politically motivated. This is not a witch hunt. No one's trying to harm anybody. We just want to do the business of our government and our country and do the best that we can for that and make sure that they have the confidence in the people that they've put at the head and have elected. That's what we're trying to get to. Today's been very difficult by me sitting here listening to some of the answers and an un inability to answer some of the questions. If the Intelligence Committee in the Senate cannot get answers we know uh, in an open setting like this, are these answers that we're asking, the questions that were simply asked today, would they be given into a classified intel setting uh, that we would have? Could you, could you answer differently than what you've given us up an open session? I think uh, Director Coach, you said that you would be able to answer differently in a... I think I've made that very clear. Yes. I've tried Admiral to. Rogers, would you be able and, to... And likewise, I certainly hope so. Uh, Mr. Rosenstein, would you? Uh, Senator, speaking for Mr. McCabe and myself, uh, you know, we have been involved in managing the criminal investigation. Uh, and so I would ask that you, uh, as Chairman Bear suggested, it's really appropriate for Director Mueller, since we've turned over control of that investigation to him, to make the determination in the first instance about what we can and can't speak about. Uh, so I would encourage you to use Mr. Mueller as your point person uh, as to whether or not it's appropriate to reveal that information. Well, let's just say that the questions that was asked to Mr. McCabe, I think they weren't anything on the uh, investigation side. It was asked pretty personal directly. Could you answer differently in a, in a, in a classified setting, sir? I would reiterate uh, the DAG's comments that it's at this point, with the special counsel involved, it would be appropriate for the committee to, to um, have an understanding with the special counsel's office as to where those questions would go. But I would also point out that as we have historically, when we are investigating sensitive matters uh, in which operational security is of utmost importance, uh, members of the intelligence community typically come and brief the leadership uh, congressional leadership on sensitive investigative matters. We have done so. I have done so. Director Comey has done so prior to the appointment of the special counsel. And some of the questions that you have asked this morning were addressed in those closed, very restricted, very... Let me say this, that if it would be the desire of the chairman and vice chairman, if we could, since we have a classified hearing scheduled for 2 o'clock this afternoon, would you all make yourself available? Since it doesn't linger on, there's been a lot of questions, a lot of anticipation, a lot of build-up anxiety, if you will. I think you could really help an awful lot of us uh, clear the day up, if you will. If I could address the uh, senator's question, this afternoon is set with technical people to walk us through 702. Uh, rest assured that we will take the first available opportunity to have people back in closed session to address those questions that they can address. And hopefully prior to that, the vice chair and I would have an opportunity to meet with Director Mueller to determine whether that fits within the scope of his current investigation, and we will do that. Well, Mr. Chairman, the only thing I'm saying is that I, I know that uh, you can tell by the intensity of the questions here that there's a lot of concerns right now, and we have both Director Coates and Admiral Rogers who are willing to say in a classified hearing that they would uh, be able to answer differently. That's the only reason I was bringing that up, and we had it this, this afternoon. I would hope that would maybe be considered. Let me ask a question. Does the President support Section 702 reauthorization of the FISA and expanded authority? Absolutely. Everyone? Full support. Full support there. Uh, did the President ask or was he given any specific intelligence or info concerning the Russian uh, 
active measures in the 2016 presidential election. Was he briefed on that? Did he ask for that briefing, or did it is an automatic briefing that you give? Admiral Rogers. Well, all, all that took place before I was. Uh, so I will say correct. yes, he was briefed on the results of the intelligence community assessment. I was part of that um, in January, prior to his assuming his duties. He and I have discussed as well the specifics of that assessment subsequent to him after he had become the president, assumed the duties. Let me just say, just in finishing up, I, I just would hope that you all, with your expertise and all of your knowledge, would help us uh, put closure to this sooner or later. I mean, we need your help. We need your assistance. We really do. And this is a committee that I think will take the facts as you give them to us and decipher that and come up with a uh, some appropriate uh, action and, and, and a final report, which is, I think, what the public is looking for. We can't do that without your assistance. So thank you all. And, and Senator, I, I, I fully understand that uh, statement. And uh, as the, the chairman uh, mentioned, uh, the procedures he's going to put in place relative to when we hold that hearing and the relationship it is to the uh, official investigation that's going on by D Director Mueller. Um, will dictate when and how we do that. I think we need you in the skiff sooner than later. Thank you. Senator Cotton. Thank you, gentlemen. I want to talk about the import of Section 702 to our national security. Uh, Adam Rogers, I'll direct most of these questions to you as the subject matter expert on the panel on signals intelligence from foreign threats. Though I might turn to some of our lawyers uh, for legal questions. Does Section 702, Admiral Rogers, allow you to collect information on U.S. citizens? As intentionally targeted individuals? Yes, no. Intentionally target them. No. Does it, allow you, does it allow you to target foreigners uh, to do what's called reverse targeting of U.S. citizens, knowing those U.S. citizens are in communications? No, it does not. Does it allow you to collect information on foreigners who are on U.S. soil? No. It does. Number two is outside the United States. So you can collect information on an ISIS terrorist in Syria. And he comes to the United States, and you can no longer collect information on his cell phone or his email address. We're in a foreign intelligence organization. We coordinate with the FBI. But yes, sir, we don't do internal domestic collection Mr. broadly. Mr. Rosenstein, do foreigners have constitutional rights? Uh, when they're in the United States, Senator, different rules apply, and that's why uh, I think it's important for people to understand that Section 702 uh, applies only in circumstances where it's a foreign national outside the United States. If they're inside the United States, we need to rely on other provisions of FISA to do that collection. So yes, we can do it, uh, but we need to apply different rules. And Mr. McCabe, uh, uh, as the director indicated, is responsible for that. Mr. McCabe, what happens when a ISIS terrorist comes from Syria to the United States and Director Rogers, or Admiral Rogers, can no longer use Section 702 to monitor his electronic communications? Yeah, Admiral, Admiral Rogers folks notify mine, and then we work together to uh, pursue coverage under different elements of the FISA statute. Um, I, I'm sure you work as hard as you can to make sure that it's absolutely seamless, but it does seem to me that Section 702, because it's limited to foreigners on foreign soil without targeting any U.S. persons anywhere, goes the extra mile to protect the constitutional rights of American citizens and even the supposed constitutional rights of foreigners when they come on U.S. soil. That's one reason why I support the permanent extension of Section 702, and I introduced legislation to that effect yesterday with the support of all seven Republicans on this committee. Tom Bossert, uh, the counterterrorism and homeland security advisor to the President, write in today's New York Times about our legislation, the Trump administration supports this bill without condition. Admiral Rogers, is that your position? Could you repeat it again? I apologize, sir. Trump administration else. supports this bill without condition. Yes. On a scale of 1 to 10, how enthusiastic would you be if this bill passed? You can go over 10 if you'd be excessively <laughs> enthusiastic. I would be ecstatic that we'd be in a position to continue to generate significant insights for this nation's security. So you'd dial it straight up to 11? Yes, sir. Okay. Director Coates? <clears throat> My level's about 100. <clears throat> Mr. Rosenstein? Uh, Senator, I'm not familiar with the rating system. Uh, I do think it's very important. Director McCabe. I'm at 11. Uh, Director uh, Coach, you had an exchange earlier with Senator Wyden about the efforts to estimate and declassify the number of persons who might be subject to incidental collection under Section 702. This is when you have a lawful 702 order, uh, but someone does, in fact, communicate with an American citizen. Um, it's my understanding that it would be virtually impossible to do so in a way that wouldn't 
further infringe on the rights of American citizens. Is that correct? Well, that's yes, and that's one of the central reasons why uh, I came to the conclusion. Uh, but the main reason I came to the conclusion is that is just is not conceivably possible. We could go through the procedures. We could shift hundreds of people to go over and breach the rights of hundreds, if not thousands, of, of American citizens to determine what whether of individuals to determine whether or not they are American citizens or not. Um, but we still, having done that, could not get to an accurate number, the number that Senator Wyden was trying to, to get us to. And I was my my pledge to him is I would go out there, try to fully understand why it was we couldn't get that. Uh, there'll be detailed discussions on that and the closed session with the staff and the technicians from both NSA and from uh, Senate staff here and others um, uh, relative to all of the efforts that have been made to try to answer the question. Uh, and as I st said in my statement, even if we were to take people off their regular jobs and say, get on this issue, uh, even if um, uh, uh, we could put other measures in place, we still would not be able to come up. It's hard to explain how difficult this is or why this is the case, um, but that is what is going to be discussed in the, in the closed session because all of this is classified information uh, this, this afternoon. Um, I assume the staff of members, uh, all the members here will be there. But my pledge was to do the best I could to try to get to, the, to, to some answer. And the result was we couldn't get to an answer um, uh, number one and number two, trying to get to an answer uh, would totally disrupt the efforts uh, of the agency. Now, if you know, you might be able to make the case. Let's hire a thousand more people and get to the answer. Uh, if you knew that you would get to the answer, um, Admiral Rogers has told me. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this: that you know, if someone else out there knows how to get to it, he's welcome to have have them come out and tell NSA how to do it. Well, but everybody says get to, you can get to the number. It's easy. There's all kinds of agencies out there that can do it. I think you might welcome the advice if, if uh, they wanted to do that. So we, it hire, really raises the question of why there has to be an exact number. Well, if we're going to hire 1,000 new people, I'd sooner them focus on terrorists and foreign intelligence services than violating the privacy rights of American citizens. My time has expired. Senator Harris. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Rogers, in response to the question from Senator Manchin, um, you, it appears, felt free to discuss the conversations you've had with the President in January about Russian ac um, active measures. Can you share with this committee how you're determining which conversations you can share and which you don't feel free to share? Ma'am, the fact that we briefed uh, the President previously, both went up to New York and previously is a matter of public record. So if it's a matter of public record, then you feel free to discuss those conversations? If it's not classified. You can keep trying to trip the, me up. It's Senator, not, if you could, can I get to respond, please, ma'am? No, sir. No, no. Okay. Um, are you saying that if it is classified, you will not discuss it? And then my follow-up question, obviously, would be, do you believe that discussion of Russian active measures is not the subject of classified information? I stand by my previous comments. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rosenstein, uh, when you appointed a special counsel on May 17th, you stated, quote, based upon the unique circumstances, the public interest requires me to place this investigation under the authority of a person who exercises a degree of independence from the normal chain of command. The order you issued along with that statement provides that 28 CFR 600.4 through 10 were applicable. Those are otherwise known as the special counsel regulations. Is that correct? Yes, Senator. And um, it states that the special counsel, quote, shall not be subject to the day-to-day -day supervision of any official of the department. However, the regulations permit you as acting attorney general for this matter to override D uh, Director Mueller's uh, investigative and prosecutorial decisions under specified circumstances. Is that correct? Yes, Senator. And uh, it also provides that you may fire or remove Director <clears throat> Mueller under specified circumstances. Is that correct? Yes. And um, you indicated in your statement that you chose a person who exercises a degree of independence, not full independence, from the normal chain of command. So my question is this. 
In December of 2003, then Attorney General John Ashcroft recused himself from the investigation into the leak that led to the disclosure of Valerie Plame's identity as a CIA officer. The acting Attorney General at the time was Jim Comey. He appointed a special counsel, Patrick Fitzgerald, to take over the matter. In a letter dated December 30th of 2003, Mr. Comey wrote the following to Mr. Fitzgerald, quote, I direct you to exercise the authority as special counsel independent of the supervision or control of any officer of the department. In a subsequent letter dated February 6, 2004, Mr. Comey wrote to clarify the earlier letter stating that his delegation of authority to Mr. Fitzgerald was, quote, plenary. Moreover, it said that my, quote, conferral on you of the title of special counsel in this matter should not be misunderstood to suggest that your position and authorities are defined or limited by 28 CFR Part 600. Those are the special counsel regulations we discussed. So would you agree, Mr. Rosenstein, to provide a letter to Director Mueller similarly, providing that Director Mueller has the authority as special counsel quote, independent of the supervision or control of any officer of the department and ensure that Director Mueller has the authority that is plenary and not, quote, defined or limited by the special counsel regulations. Well, Senator, I'm very sensitive about time, and I'd like to have a very lengthy conversation and explain that all to you. I, I tried to do that. Can you give me a yes or no uh, answer, In the closed please? briefing. Well, it, it's not a short answer, Senator. The answer it, is... It is either you are willing to well, do that or not, as, as has, we have precedent. In well, that the, regard. But the, 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 the chairman, they should be allowed to answer the question. It's a, it's a long question you pose, Senator, and I fully appreciate the import of your question, uh, and I'll get to the answer. Uh, the, my, my quibble with you is Pat Fitzgerald is a very principled, very independent person. I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, Pat Fitzgerald could have been fired by the president because he was a United States attorney. Robert Mueller cannot because he's protected by those special counsel regulations. So although it's theoretically true that there are circumstances where he could be removed by the acting attorney general, which for this case at this time is me, your assurance of his independence is Robert Mueller's integrity and Andy McCabe's integrity and my integrity and those regulations. Sir, if I, if I may, the, the greater assurance is not that you and I believe in Director Mueller's integrity, which I have no question about Mr. Mueller's integrity. It is that you would put in writing an indication based on your authority as the acting attorney general that he has full independence in regards to the investigations that are before him. Are you willing or are you not willing to give him the authority to be fully independent of your ability statutorily and legally to fire him? He is, he has the, yes or no, sir? He, he has the full independence that is authorized by those regulations. And Are Senator, you willing said, to do as has been the, done before? Would the senator suspend? The chair is going to exercise its right to allow the witnesses to answer the question, and the committee is on notice to provide the witnesses the courtesy, which has not been extended all the way across, ex extend the courtesy for questions to get answered. Mr. Chairman, respectfully, Mr. Rosenstein, I would point out you, that this witness has joked with the, as we all have, the senator will ability to filibuster. I, Mr. I, Rosenstein, would you like to thoroughly answer the question? Thank you, Chairman. Sir, I'm not joking. Uh, uh, you know, the, the truth is, I have a lot of uh, experience with these issues, uh, and I could give, I could speak to you for a very long time about it. And I'm sympathetic. I appreciate the five-minute uh, limit. That's not my limit. Uh, but, but the answer is, it, it's. Uh, uh, this originated, as you may know, with the independent counsel statute. And I worked for an independent counsel, and I worked in the department during the independent counsel era uh, when independent counsels were appointed by authorization of the Senate. They were appointed by federal judges, and they had the, essentially the authority equivalent to the attorney general. Uh, that statute sunsetted, and the majority of members of this body uh, concluded that that was appropriate because they did not want special independent counsels who were 100 percent independent of the Department of Justice. That was a determination made by the legislature. Now, uh, I know the folks at the department who drafted this regulation under Janet Reno, and they drafted it to deal with this type of circumstance. And the idea was that there would be some circumstances where, uh, because of unusual events, it was appropriate to appoint somebody from outside the department, not somebody like Pat Fitzgerald, who was a U.S. attorney who could be fired, but somebody from outside the department who could be trusted to conduct this investigation independently and could be given an appropriate degree of independence. Uh, now, uh, under the regulation, he has 
I believe, adequate authority to conduct this investigation. And your ultimate check, Senator, is, number one, the integrity of the people involved in the investigation, but number two, the fact that if he were overruled or if he were fired, uh, we would be required under the regulation to report to the Congress. Uh, and so I believe that's an appropriate check. And so while I realize that theoretically anybody could be fired, uh, and so there's a, a potential uh, for undermining an investigation, I am confident, Senator, uh, that Director Mueller, Mr. McCabe, and I and anybody else who uh, may fill those positions in the future will protect the integrity of that investigation. That's my commitment to you, and that's the guarantee that you and the American people have. Senator so Cornyn. is that a no? Senator Cornyn. Well, seems to be one thing we all agree on, at least so far based on the questions and the comments, and that is the 702 is an important tool for the intelligence community and one that needs to be preserved, and I agree with Senator Cotton uh, that it should be extended without a sunset provision um, as currently written. So it's good to have one, one thing we agree on. But I want to ask uh, Director Coates and perhaps Admiral Rogers if you want to comment on this as well. As I understand the framework of 702, it is to intentionally not target American citizens. It is to intentionally t target foreign persons and to not collect information from American citizens except by way of incidental collection. And I think you've described, Admiral Rogers, uh, the extensive procedures that the law requires and that NSA practices have in place to minimize the access of anybody in the intelligence community to that U.S. person. And indeed, you've talked about uh, purging uh, incidental collection that was uh, made in the course of a 702 um, investigation. So it strikes me, uh, Director Coates, the question that uh, Senator Wyden has asked you and that's come up several times, to intentionally target American citizens in order to generate a number is just the opposite of what the structure of 702 provides because the whole, the whole idea is to not collect not to be able to g gather information about American citizens except in the course, incidental course, of collecting information against a foreign intelligence target. Is that, is that a fair statement? That's fair in my mind, and it was a, a central piece of the uh, information um, of fact uh, that caused me to come to the conclusion that um, uh, this would this would do just exactly what you said. You, you're breaching someone's privacy to determine whether or not uh, they are an American person. To generate a list for Congress. It, it potentially could, yes, yeah. to generate a list for Congress. That wasn't the only basis on which right. we made the decision, but that was an essential basis. Thank you. I want to ask um, a little bit more about uh, the minimization procedure, procedures and the importance of those um, and a little bit about unmasking of U.S. persons' names that uh, Admiral Rogers and others have, uh, Director Coach, you've talked about. You've explained the, the process um, and the elaborate procedures that are in place to make sure that this is not done uh, accidentally or casually. Um, and I think that's very important to reassuring the American people that in the collection of foreign intelligence, we are extraordinarily protective of the privacy of U.S. citizens who might be incidentally collected against. And so, to me, the minimization procedures are very important. The internal policies of the NSA when it comes to collecting foreign intelligence that happens to incidentally impact American citizens is absolutely critical to uh, this balance between security and uh, individual privacy. Perhaps this is a question uh, for Mr. Rosenstein, though, and maybe Director McCabe. If someone is to use the unmasking process for a political purpose, is that potentially a crime? <clears throat> yes, Senator. And Director um, McCabe, perhaps, or uh, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein, for somebody to leak the name of an American citizen that is unmasked in the course of incidental collection 
to leak that classified information, is that also potentially a crime? Yes, I think that's the most significant point, Senator. I think it's important for people to understand unmasking is done in the course of ordinary legitimate intelligence gathering when the identity of the person on the other end of the phone, the other end of the message, may be relevant to understand the intelligence significance of the communication. Leaking is a completely different matter. Leaking is a crime. Disclosing information to somebody without a legitimate purpose, need to know that information, uh, that will be prosecuted in appropriate circumstances. And there have been cases where we've been able to determine there's a willful violation uh, of federal law, a disclosure that was not authorized, and prosecutions have been brought and will be brought. And Mr. Rosenstein, not to pick on you um, or Director McCabe, but I, I think there's some confusion when we talk about generically about Russian investigations. Uh, we've described the role of the special counsel, which I think you've discussed in great detail. But that's primarily to investigate potential criminal acts and counterintelligence activities, um, is it not? I, I, the answer to that is, is yes. Um, it, it is the idea of the Russian investigation that, that has much broader significance, I know, to many of you uh, than the piece that Director uh, McCabe and I are referring to, and the piece that uh, Director Mueller is investigating. Right. Well, that's that's enormously helpful, at least to me. Because when people speak generically of the Russian investigation, um, I think they're also including things like our responsibilities, the Intelligence com uh, Committee, to do oversight of, of the intelligence uh, and of the counter potential countermeasures we might undertake to deal with the active measures campaign of the Russian government, which were clearly documented in the intelligence uh, community assessment. But by my count, there are multiple committees of the United States Senate, including the Judiciary Committee on which I serve, which has different jurisdiction and oversight responsibilities. It's our job to do the investigation and write legislation. We're not the FBI. We're not the special counsel. We're not the Department of Justice. And I'm afraid in the conversation that we've been having here, people have been conflating all of those. And those are very distinct and importantly distinct uh, functions. Thank you. Senator Reid. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Director McCabe, on May 11th, you testified, quote, Director Comey enjoyed broad support when the FBI and still does to this day, and then you added that you hold him in the absolute highest regard. Is still that the case? It is, sir. Thank you. Uh, Director McCabe, I'm trying to understand the rationale for uh, your unwillingness to comment upon your conversations with Director Comey. First, uh, you have had, I would presume, and correct me if I'm wrong, conversations with uh, Mr. Mueller. Uh, you've had those conversations. Yes, sir. You're fully familiar with the scope of the investigation uh, since you've dealt with not only Mr. Mueller but also with... I, I am, sir, but I think it's important to note that Mr. Mueller and his team are currently in the process of determining what that scope is. And much in the way that Senator Cornyn just referred to, the FBI maintains a broad, much broader uh, responsibility to continue investigating uh, issues relative to potential uh, Russian uh, counterintelligence uh, activity and, and threat, uh, threats posed to us from uh, our Russian adversaries. Okay. So, so yes, determining sir. exactly where those lanes in the road are, where does Director Mueller's uh, scope overlap into our pre-existing and long-running Russian responsibilities is somewhat of a challenge at the moment, and that is why I'm trying to be particularly respectful of his efforts and not to take any steps that might compromise his investigation. But getting back to your rationale for not commenting on the conversation between you and Mr. Comey, there's, uh, it seems to me that what you've said is that there, either that is part of a criminal investigation or likely to become part of a criminal investigation, the conversation between the President of the United States and Mr. Comey, and therefore you cannot properly comment on that. Is that accurate? That's accurate, sir. What about the conversations between Director Coates and Admiral Rogers with the President of the United States? Is that likely to become or is part of an ongoing criminal investigation? I couldn't comment on that, sir. I'm not, um, I'm not familiar with that, and it wouldn't be for the same reasons it's not appropriate for me to comment on Director Comey's conversations. I, I certainly wouldn't comment on those that I'm further away from. 
Mr. Rosenstein, are you aware of uh, the possibility of an investigation, the conversations that Director Coates and Adam Rogers have had with the President? My familiarity with that, Senator, is limited to uh, what I read in the newspaper this morning and what we heard here today. Okay. Uh, Director Coates, have you had uh, any contact with uh, the Special Prosecutor or any... Uh, I have not. Have you been advised by any of your counsels uh, or private or public, that uh, these, this conversation that you have with the president could be subject to a criminal investigation? I have no. I have not. Admiral Rogers, the same question. Um, uh, to the last question, no, I have not. Yeah. Let me just return again to the, the, the points that I think uh, Senator King made very well, which is this uh, unwillingness to comment on the conversation with the president, but to characterize it in a way that you didn't feel pressured, yet refusing to answer a very specific and non-intelligence-related issue. I don't see how it would impact on the classification and our status, whether or not you were specifically asked by the president to do anything. Uh, do you still maintain that you can't comment on whether you're asked or not? Uh, nothing has changed uh, since my initial response. I stand by my previous answer. I just must say, the impression I have is that uh, uh, if you could say that, you would say that. Thank you. I have no further question. Senator McCain. Well, gentlemen, you're here at an interesting time. It's funny how sometimes events run together. This morning's Washington Post top intelligence official told associates Trump asked him if he could intervene with Comey on FBI Russia probe. Uh, it goes into some detail. I'm sure you've, you've read the article. And uh, it's more than disturbing, obviously, if it's true that the President of the United States was trying to get the Director of National Intelligence and others to abandon a investigation into Russian involvement, uh, it's pretty serious. I also understand the position that you're in, because it is classified information, and yet here it is on this morning's Washington Post in some detail. I'm sure you've, you've read it. So I guess if I understand you right, uh, Director Coates, is that in a closed session you are more than ready to discuss this situation. Is that correct? I would hope we'd have the opportunity to do that. Well, I hope we can provide you with that opportunity. Uh, you know, it it's just shows what kind of an Orwellian existence that we live in. I mean, it's detailed, as you, as you know, from reading the story as to when you met, what you discussed, Etc., etc., and yet here in a public hearing before the American people, we can't talk about what was described in detail in this morning's Washington Post. Do you want to comment on that, Dan? Are you, are you asking me to comment on the Washington integrity of the Washington Post reporting? I guess I've been around it's town pretty long enough. It's pretty detailed. I guess I've been around town long enough to. Uh, say, um, not take everything at, at face value that's printed in the post. I served on the uh, committee here and uh, often uh, saw that uh, information that we had been discussed had been reported, but that wasn't always accurate. Um, but um, I think this is uh, uh, the response that I, I gave to the post. Uh, uh, was that um, I did not want to publicly share what I thought were private conversations with the President of the United States, most of them, almost all of them, intelligence-related and classified. And I didn't think it was appropriate to do so in a open, uh, for the Post to uh, report what it reported or, or do that uh, in an open session. Well, it's an unfortunate situation that <clears throat> you're sitting there because it's classified information, and this morning's Washington Post describes in some detail, not just outline, but times and dates and subjects that 
are being discussed, and I'm certainly not blaming you, but it certainly is an interesting town in which we exist. Uh, yeah, just because it's uh, published uh, uh, in, the, in the Washington Post doesn't mean it's all now un unclassified. <clears throat> But unfortunately, whether it's classified or not, it's now out to the world, uh, which is obviously not your fault, but describes dates and times and who met with who. And uh, so, well, do you, do you want to tell us any more about the Russian involvement in our election that we don't already know from reading the Washington Post? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's, uh, uh, that's a position that I'm in. I do know that uh, there are ongoing investigations. I do know that we continue to provide uh, all the relevant uh, intelligence we have uh, to enable those uh, investigations to be uh, carried out uh, with integrity and with uh, knowledge. Well, it must be a bit frustrating to you in protecting what is clearly sensitive information and then to read all about it in, in the Washington Post. You have my sympathy, and I express that at your confirmation hearing, doubting your sanity. So, Admiral, you got anything to say about it? No, sir, other than, uh, boy, some days I sure wish I was an ensign on the bridge of that destroyer again. I can understand that. I feel the same way. <laughs> Mr. Rosenstein. Senator, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I am proud to be here. I'm proud to be here with Director McCabe, and I'm sure he feels the same way. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that might mean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Senator McCain. Uh, the chair is going to recognize Senator Wyden for one question on 702. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the courtesy. This one... Uh, Director Coates, I'd like a yes or no answer on. Can the government use FISA Act Section 702 to collect communications it knows are entirely domestic? Not to my knowledge. It would be against the law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Warner. Again, I want to thank all the witnesses, but I come out of this hearing with more questions than when I went in. Gentlemen, you were both willing to somehow characterize your conversations with the president. That you didn't feel pressure, but you wouldn't share the content. Uh, in the case of Admiral Rogers, we will have an uh, independent third party that will at least provide some level of contemporaneous description of, of that conversation and obviously why there was concerns enough to, to c commit that to writing. I'm pretty frustrated that there is this deference to the special prosecutor, even though the special prosecutor has not talked to you. I'm concerned with the deputy attorney general also deference to the special prosecutor, but there doesn't seem to be, and this committee and, and the chairman and I are committed to making sure that we appropriately deconflict. What we don't seem to have is the same commitment to find out whether the President of the United States tried to intervene directly with leaders of our intelligence community and ask them to back off or downplay, you, you've testified to the, your feelings response. Candidly, your feelings response is important, but the content of his communication with you is absolutely critical. And I guess I would just say, the president's not above the law. If the president intervenes in, in a conversation, and intervenes in an investigation like that, would that not be subject of some concern? Mr. Rosenstein? Senator, if anybody obstructs a federal investigation, it would be a subject of concern. I don't care who they are. And I can commit to you, if you're looking for commitment from Mr. McCabe and from me, that if there is any credible allegation 
uh, that anybody seeks to obstruct a federal investigation, it will be investigated appropriately, whether it's by Mr. McKay, by me, by the special counsel. That's our responsibility, and we'll see to it. Well, I thank the chairman for the fact that we've been working on this in a bipartisan way, and we will ultimately have to get to the content of those conversations. Thank you. Director Coates, I know you've got to go give me 90 more seconds, if I could. And this question probably to you, Admiral Rogers. Have our partners globally used 702 intelligence to stop a terrorist attack? <laughs> Yes, sir. And I, if we were not, if we were to lose a 702 authority, I would fully expect leaders from some of our closest allies to put out one loud scream. And in most cases, didn't they take credit for our intelligence? <laughs> we don't. Pub they don't publicly talk about where it comes from, but we acknowledge NSA is a is a primary provider of insights. I just wanted to get on the record. Yes, sir. A host this of nations. Is a global asset yes. that the war on terror has is 702. Sir. Now, Mr. Black Chairman, if I could just take yes, the time you, you were trying to protect for me for my next appointment to just say following, uh, and I just want to repeat, following my interaction uh, with my contemporaries in a number of European countries, um, they are deeply, deeply grateful to us for the information derived from 702 has saved what they said literally hundreds of lives. Well, certainly the committee is privy to those instances in a lot of cases, and we're grateful for that. Um, and gentlemen, I, I, I want to wanna thank you for your testimony. But before we adjourn, I would ask each of you to take a message back to the administration. You're in positions whereby you're required to keep this committee fully and currently informed of intelligence activities. In cases where the sensitivity of those activities would not be appropriate for the full committee or open session, there's a mechanism that you may use to brief the appropriate parties. It's sometimes often referred to as the Gang of Eight notification briefing, and I think without exception, everybody at the table has utilized that tool before. Congressional oversight of the intelligence activities of our government is necessary and it must be robust. Thus, the provisions of this unique briefing mechanism, given the availability of that sensitive briefing avenue, at no time should you be in a position where you come to Congress without an answer. It may be in a different format, but the requirements of our oversight duties and your agencies demand it. With that, again, I thank you for being here. This hearing's adjourned.
Thanks. 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 Thanks.